Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my ex-crush is trying to end my relationship with my girlfriend after all of these years of ignoring me. I've had a crush on this girl since way back when we were in elementary. We were close friends, and I confessed my feelings to her when we were 13. We got together, but things changed in high school. She was always popular, but she became even more so in high school. She started to act cold and distant towards me. She made me feel like I was not that special to her anymore. She probably thought that dating me would ruin her status or something. That's what I felt like when I tried to talk to her in private. She would always be aware of her surroundings, and I wasn't popular. She dated and broke up with three popular guys during high school, and I was still not over her. Her third guy in high school left the country because his parents got a job offer abroad. Fast forward to college, and in the first year of college, she dated a new guy, broke up with him for her third one, and I was still single. But my feelings for her started to fade. Since we went to different colleges and not seeing her every day, it helps me to cope with my feelings. I wish it had happened sooner, because it really affected me in high school. I was often lost in thought and distracted. I'm not complaining though. I had good friends who hung out with me and were really bros to me. But then, in the second year of college, I realized that I had feelings for this girl who was in my first year class. I never thought of her that way before, but we got to know each other better and better. We started texting, talking, and hanging out. We became official and I was happy. My ex-crush started to be friendly with me again. She tried to get close to me and I ignored her. She didn't like that, so she told my girlfriend that I had a crush on her since we were younger. She also lied and said that I was just dating my girlfriend to get back at her or something. My girlfriend was upset and hurt. She didn't believe me when I told her that it was a long time ago and that I only love her now. The more I tried to explain, the more she pushed me away. I hate what my ex-crush did to me. She sabotaged it, and what on earth was this for? Did she rekindle her love for me after all of these years? I don't understand. I never sabotaged her relationship with those guys she dated. I respected her wishes and set the boundaries. How can I fix this? How can I not let my girlfriend break up with me over this? Send your ex-crush a message explaining in no uncertain terms that you are not now and never will be again interested in her, and her behavior towards the woman that you love has cemented that you don't even want to be friends with her. Tell her that you and your new girlfriend, with whom you are deliriously happy, will be blocking her and will be ignoring any further attempts at communication. Then show your new girlfriend the message. I'm sorry this happened to you. It sounds like your ex-crush liked having you around as a fallback option someone she could always rely on for attention when she wanted it. Somehow, maybe she thought you'd always be there. When she saw you moving on and happy with someone else, she got jealous and tried to sabotage your relationship. What a selfish and narcissistic thing to do. Please block her and tell your current girlfriend what you told us and show her that you blocked the ex-crush. Good luck. I disagree with all these people who are saying that you were her backup plan. That would mean that there was a scenario where she would have dated you. But that isn't your role in her life. Your role is to boost her ego. She never would have dated you, but you've abandoned your role. How dare you stop boosting her ego? She's upset and going to make you pay for that. Update. I decided to follow the majority of what you said and block my ex-crush from my life. I also circled the wagons with our mutual friends and told them what she did. Most of them were supportive and understanding. Some of them were surprised and disappointed in her. A few of them tried to defend her and said she was just confused or jealous. I don't care about her reasons. She crossed the line and she hurt me and my girlfriend. I sent her a final message before blocking her on all social media. I told her that there is no such thing as me and her. I respect our time together as acquaintances when we attended the same school, but nothing more and nothing less. I told her that I love my girlfriend and that she should leave us alone. I also told her that she needs to work on herself and stop being so manipulative and selfish. After I sent her the final message, I took a screenshot of it and sent it to my girlfriend. I wanted to show her that I was serious about cutting off my ex-crush and that I had nothing to hide from her. I also sent a message to my girlfriend and apologized for everything. I told her that I love her more than anything and she is the only one for me. I told her that I blocked my ex-crush and cut off all contact with her. I told her that I understand if she needs time and space to process everything, but I hope that we can work through things together. She replied to me and said she was glad that I blocked my ex. She said that she was hurt by what she did but she also trusts me and believes me. She said that she loves me too and that she wants to stay with me. She said she needs time to heal, but she's willing to talk to me and see me again. I'm so relieved and happy she didn't break up with me. 
I love her so much, and I don't want to lose her over something stupid like this. I'm going to do everything I can to make her happy and secure in our relationship. I'm not impressed at all with OP's girlfriend. She doesn't hesitate to believe his ex, doesn't want to listen to his side of the story, and now she needs time to heal? How ridiculous is that? No one actually got hurt in this situation besides OP. She owes him a serious apology, but instead makes this about her and her own insecurities. Maybe there's information missing that would explain why she feels hurt in some way. But if this is all there is, she's well in the wrong. There's a serious lack of self-esteem for all parties involved. Yeah, that got me too. I tentatively want to give her the benefit of the doubt because I remember how much emotional maturity I didn't have at the age of 20, but I'm definitely not impressed. Is no one going to mention the girlfriend? She needs time to heal? From what? Then she has the nerve to say she doesn't believe him, then afterwards fawn over him and say she needs time to heal. OP has horrible taste in women. These two sound pretentious and self-centered as heck. Sometimes I'm really happy to be my age. Being 20 is really not all it's cracked up to be. Am I the jerk for telling my sister it's gold digging money she's borrowing from me? I'm not in the US. I, 33 female, have a sister, Sarah, who's 36. Sarah has always been good at studying and is our parents' pride and joy. She got into a very good university's engineering program on a full scholarship and had a nice job offer upon graduation. We were all proud of her. In comparison, I was a mediocre student. I got into a less prestigious university studying something Sarah said to our parents won't get me a good job, but my parents helped me pay my tuition nevertheless, though I had to work for spending money and other expenses. Through work, I met my now husband. He's from a family of generational wealth with their own business. We married when I graduated and my sister said she was very disappointed in me for being a gold digger and that we women should not rely on a man's money to get ahead in life. Sarah left the company at 30 to start her own business with her now husband. The business was doing quite well until lockdown. They struggled but managed to keep the business together until this year. Sarah confessed to our parents that she needs a large amount of money to keep her business afloat. My parents suggested that she borrow from me. Now, I do have the amount of money that Sarah needs. My husband heads his family company and gives me spending money every month in addition to a credit card he takes care of. I don't work. My days are spent looking after our two sons and, for a few days a week, keeping his mom company. She's a lovely lady who's still very active and enjoys taking me places. Every time we go out, she always pays the bills, so I have a lot of money saved. Sarah and her husband approached me in private a few days ago. They asked to borrow money from me with a detailed plan on how they would pay me back, though with much lower interest than from a bank and a contract. Here's where I may be the jerk. I wrote them a check and as I handed it to her, I looked her in the eyes and asked, you do realize you're borrowing my gold digging money, right? Sarah went red in the face before she immediately got up and walked away. Her husband looked a little awkward, but finally took the check and mumbled his thanks and left. Later, my mom called me and said I was being cruel to Sarah during her hard time, that there was no need to humiliate my sister like that. I simply told my mom she never said anything when Sarah called me a gold digger, so she has no say in the matter. Still, I wonder if I was the jerk. Not the jerk. It's not okay for you to rely on your husband's money, but it's okay for your sister to rely on your money, which is both yours and your husband's. She doesn't like being reminded that she judged you for relying on a man, and now she's reliant on that same man. She doesn't even have the excuse of being married to him. She's relying on another woman's man to stay afloat. I don't care about how you choose to live. If you marry for love or money or both or neither. If you have a strong work ethic or drive to succeed, or if you want to coast along and relax. I do care about women judging each other for their choices, but expecting that their choices are held to a different standard because they picked the right path. Don't dish it if you can't take it. Not the jerk. Before she needed your help, she deemed your life choices disappointing. No harm reminding her that she is accepting help from that disappointment, especially if she continued to throw that at you over the years. Part of me wonders if she realized the ironicness of asking for your help, or if she just suddenly felt entitled to help from a family member that was better off. Not the jerk, but you're kind of the jerk for the timing. I know I might get crap for saying this. I mean, you could have said that before handing her the check or after maybe, but saying that during a person's tough time and especially while handing her the check, you're kind of a jerk. And you're right, your mother doesn't have a say in this and your sister deserved that. 
everyone sucks here. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, blood for blood, an arm for an arm. What are you talking about? Am I the jerk for buying my former nanny a house instead of my dad? So I, 30 female, recently bought a house for my former nanny. My entire childhood I was raised by my nanny, Jane, as my mom was the breadwinner and my dad wasn't in the picture at all. Jane attended every after-school activity, graduation, and parent-teacher conference. Jane basically raised me and I see her as my second mom. My mom employed Jane as a nanny slash housekeeper from when I was two until I was 28, when my mom passed due to cancer. As a result, I inherited everything. My mom was a successful surgeon with her own practice and my grandparents left her with a few properties in her home country. I have since rented the properties out, giving me a good rental income. Well, after my mom passed, Jane was there for me. She helped me make all of the funeral arrangements and contact relatives from my mom's home country. After she helped me through this difficult time, I wanted to do something nice to thank Jane. As a birthday gift, I surprised Jane with a deed to a two-bed, two-bath house in an area of the country she had always talked about wanting to retire in. Jane tried to decline the gift, saying it was too much, but I told her she was like a second mother to me and that this was the least I could do for her as a thanks for raising me. Well, somehow word got back to my dad that I had bought a house for Jane and he turned up at my mom's old practice demanding to talk to me. I didn't even know who the man was as I've seen him less than 20 times my entire life. He claimed to be my father and yelled at me for buying a house for a stranger over someone who is family and says he and his family of five have been struggling financially. He even had the audacity to say that I should buy a house for him and my half-siblings who I've never even met because they are my blood family and I owe it to them. I laughed in his face and told him that Jane had been far more involved in my life growing up than he ever had and that I didn't care if he was struggling financially. Security then escorted him to his car and made sure he left the property. My dad's side of the family have now been trying to reach out through Facebook, complete strangers who I've never even met, saying that I'm a jerk and that my mom never let him be part of my life. I know this is false since I remember my mom calling him over the years asking him to pick me up on the weekends and spend time with me, but he never did. I tried to talk with my friend Aiden, who's 34, male, about this problem, who recently reconnected with his dad, who he hadn't seen since he was six due to his dad being incarcerated. Aiden told me that my dad probably had a good reason for leaving and that I'm the jerk because some people don't even have dads. I reminded him I was one of those people. Now he's refusing to talk to me. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Your finances are none of your dad's business, not the jerk. If you don't launch the ship, never stand on the dock with your hand out when it returns. You made another family, all the while ignoring being family to me. Do you even know what color my eyes are or what my favorite color is? You might be father figure to someone else, but never to me. So yeah, your life sucks, pal. Good luck with that. Greed is horrible, and your friend has no depth of background to appreciate what you're going through or to judge you. None so that friend can shut up. You don't get to have a spoken opinion when you don't know what it's like to be me. Am I the jerk for canceling my niece's trip so I can go on one with my boyfriend? So I, 26 female, initially planned on going with my niece, who's 11, and brother, who's 37, on a trip to her mother's home country during summer vacation. My niece's mother passed when she was less than a year old, and the trip was going to be the first time my niece would be visiting her mother's home country as well as the second time she gets to see her maternal grandparents since her mother's passing. However, my niece suffers from attachment issues, which cause her to have severe anxiety. As a result, she has panic attacks whenever she goes to unfamiliar places without her dad or I present. Short trips to nearby places are fine with just her dad, but because this trip will be for a month and somewhere far away, that's very different from what she's used to, and I have to be present for the trip to happen. I had agreed to the trip about a year ago under the pretense that it would likely happen in June of this year. Last month, my boyfriend, who's 26, asked me to spend two weeks with him and his family in Italy during August. I agreed as it wouldn't interfere with my niece's trip. However, last week my brother told me that he could only get time off for the last two weeks of July and first two of August during summer vacation, which interfered with a trip to Italy. My boyfriend can't reschedule as it's the only time that works for his family. I asked my brother about moving my niece's trip to some time during the school year, but she has recitals and events that she can't miss. Originally, I was planning on missing the trip to Italy, but after speaking about it with my boyfriend's sister, she hinted at my boyfriend proposing to me during the trip. 
My boyfriend and I have been together since we were in high school, and a large reason why we aren't engaged yet is because my niece's dependency on me. He's been more than understanding towards the situation, which would make me feel awful if I delayed his proposal for my niece again. To be honest, I'm also tired of having to put my life on hold for my niece, so I told my brother I couldn't go on the trip with them, which essentially meant that he had to cancel the trip. He was very mad at me, probably the most mad I've seen him since niece was born, and called me a jerk, as well as some other choice words for accepting to go on another trip when I had already agreed to this one. I was taking my niece to therapy this week, and the therapist pulled me aside to tell me how much my decision was hurting my niece. She didn't sound like she was blaming me, but it made me start to rethink my decision. I brought it up with a few friends, and the reactions were mixed. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I had to go back and double check how long it had been since your niece's mom had passed. It might be different if it had been a recent loss, but you can't place your life on hold indefinitely. Reading the title, I thought you'd cancel the scheduled trip for your boyfriend, but you committed to a different time frame with your brother. It's unfortunate that the new time frame doesn't work, but that's not your fault. Your brother has a conflict with the original time, and you have a conflict with the new time. That's just how it goes sometimes. Honestly, it sounds like she needs a new therapist. The therapist should be teaching her coping mechanisms, not trying to shame you into making things easy for her. Again, if it had been a recent loss, then some coddling would be understandable. But this is just too much. My husband has missed three out of our four kids' births. I want him to quit his job. My husband is amazing. He honestly is. I love him dearly. But oh my goodness. I had our fourth baby three days ago, and I did it alone, like the past two, because he's always being called away to work. He's a firefighter, which is notable, beautiful even. But heck, I really hate his job so much. My kids are five, three, two, and a newborn. My toddlers barely even know their dad. My oldest could care less. Every single family event, sorry, they need me in. The birth of our three out of our four kids. His boss didn't give a hoot. With our third, he missed my birth because he was coaching another woman through hers. I am so, so tired. I'm a single mom. He didn't meet our son until he was nine hours old, held him once, went back to sleep, and is now back at work. I'm a single mom. Sometimes I fantasize about us being a normal family. One birthday party, one anniversary, one family meal. I've sobbed and begged him to quit, to say no, to just do anything else. But that makes me a selfish jerk, I guess. This is probably postpartum depression. Again, because I'm alone and he's off helping other people. Can't complain because, oh, what he's doing is so amazing. I'm so tired. I'm so sad. I don't know why the heck I thought I could do this again without him. I just want to experience a birth with my husband. What kind of schedule is he working? Firefighters usually have 20 days off in a month. So either everything you have going on just happens to line up with his work schedule, the 24 or 48 hours on, or something else is happening here. Most firefighters have the ability to have a second job if they want one. Could it be that he's actively choosing to leave and is telling you it's his job? My dad was a firefighter for over 20 years and never missed this much. What type of schedule is he on? My dad had 24 hours on, 48 hours off, but I know it's different in some places. Regardless, the job shouldn't take this much time. My dad made it to almost everything we had, even coached some of our sports teams while we were young. Um, there's something else. That's not how being a fireman works. They have schedules, they have regular, even more than normal time off. They have other firemen who work. Ma'am, respectfully, unless your hubby is employed with multiple stations, there's no way he's on duty this much. This type of career field works flexible schedules. Your guy is not on duty 6 hours, 12 hour shifts weekly. No ma'am. Even if he's the chief of the fire station, he'd work 5 8 hour days. The amount of time you commented he's away for work would create significant burnout and mental issues. Think you need to take a deep dive into your husband's work activities. I'm a cop, so I know I'll be downvoted just for that. But none of you understand how much us first responders actually work, and we aren't paid hourly. We are salary, and we work our butts off for much less than we deserve. My wife divorced me because I worked too much. I also found out she'd been cheating on me with the neighbor since he was emotionally available. Her words, not mine. I worked my butt off, year after year, so she could stay home and raise our kids, which is not an actual job, no matter what you morons say. And that's how she repaid me. 
Now I pay over half my monthly salary to her for child support and alimony, and I rarely even get to see my kids since she moved three states away. My advice to younger guys out there, don't get married. If I could go back in time, I never would have. It's not worth it. Why is there always at least one of you losers in the comments? Just because you weren't man enough to be a good husband and keep your wife doesn't mean that guys should stop getting married. As a woman who's had an affair myself, I can honestly say that if husbands would actually listen to us and consider our feelings, we would be much less likely to look outside of our marriage for what we need. Hubby and I decided to open our relationship since he works a lot too. And maybe you should have considered something like that with your wife. Instead, you made everything about you. Also, forget you for being a cop. I broke up with my fiancé after she asked for an open marriage, how do I get her and our families to leave me alone? I, 27 male, had been with my fiancé, 27 female, for 5 years. We had many things in common and I really loved her. I proposed to her 10 months ago and she accepted. Our families were excited for us. They've been a real help with the planning and the financial input. I'm not much of a planner, but even I got caught up with the preparations. But then the conversation, as the title states, took place that made me break up with my fiancé and it's caused an uproar in both our families and mutual friends. We were having dinner and I asked her if her uncle had gotten back to her about officiating our wedding. She just looked at me with this weird look on her face and then she asked, what did I think about an open marriage? I was surprised. Call me old school on this mindset, but I believe when you're going to marry a person, you're committing to that person for life and that there's nobody else in that marriage but you and that person. I told her exactly this and she said we were still young and she loves me and wants to marry me and eventually have kids, but she hasn't had much experience before our relationship. I asked her what's wrong with that, but she spoke right over me and said she just wondered if I would consider an open marriage. I said no, I just told you how I felt about it and I got up to leave and she said, you haven't even given it a chance, you might change your mind. I just looked at her and everything I felt for her just died in that very moment. I told her if that's what she wants, then she's more than welcome to go do that with someone else because me and her were over. She tried to backtrack and say it was just a suggestion and she didn't actually mean it, but I didn't want to hear it. I went into our spare room and locked the door. She tried opening the door and crying and saying she was sorry and she didn't mean it. I just cried. She eventually stopped knocking, I eventually fell asleep. The next morning I went to work and told a friend what happened and asked if I could stay with him and he agreed. So that same day I moved out. She was at work when I moved out and she eventually came home and found my stuff gone and she blew up my phone. I answered the call and she was crying and saying what was I doing? I told her that last night I was serious when I said we were done. Her response went from pleading then to anger when I didn't react. I just hung up on her and blocked her number. It's been a week and she hasn't given up trying to contact me and change my mind and even got our families involved. They're saying she hadn't cheated on me and it was normal for couples to explore different options in their relationship and I took it the wrong way. I told them to leave me alone but they keep coming at me. I don't know what to do. You have every right for non-monogamy to be a deal breaker in your relationship but given the amount of ethical non-monogamy that is out there getting glorified, it's not crazy to entertain the thought and discuss it with a partner. As long as they respect their partner's no, I don't think bringing it up as a thought experiment needs to result in the nuclear option of ending the relationship. You had a very strong emotional reaction to her suggestion and went nuclear without trying to dig deeper into why she was, br why she was bringing it up. It's possible she pushed back in that original conversation because she didn't feel heard and clearly wasn't hearing you. Look, marriage will absolutely have moments where someone wants to talk about something the other person has a visceral negative reaction to. You don't end it when that happens, you stick it out and come back to the conversation when emotions have had a chance to cool. If it's over for you, it's over, but it might be worth it for you to try and have a clear-headed conversation and talk things out, if only so you can move on without anger or regrets. Absolutely agree with this comment. I don't understand how you can be with someone for five years, want to marry them, and then break up over one conversation where you don't agree. To move out without speaking to her and then block her number as well just shows very unhealthy communication and conflict resolution. How can you say you really love someone and then cut them off because they said one thing you didn't like? Thank you. Bitter men in this thread are hyping up OP like he didn't end a five-year relationship over a single conversation. What the heck? 
Hey, Reddit boy, have I ever told you that I don't even have one ounce of faith left in humanity? I'm right there with you, Karen. I'm just waiting for the comet. My girlfriend refuses to go after her baby daddy for child support because they're friends. I met my girlfriend on Tinder and we were not exclusive to begin with. We get along great and I thought we had a future. She got pregnant and we were kind of excited to start a family. When the baby was born, it was very obviously not mine. I did not sign the birth certificate. I also did not break up with her, but I also told her that I would not be making myself financially responsible for the baby. We had planned for her to take a year off of work to be with the baby. She had already taken her maternity leave. I said she needed to go after the father for child support. She didn't want to because they were friends. I said I understood, but then she had to take full financial responsibility for the kid. I would help her with all of the child rearing, like changing diapers and feedings and the like, but not for paying for any of it. She agreed. She ran through her savings in about six months. She talked to me about helping with the baby formula and stuff, and I said no, that wasn't our agreement. She called him and asked for money, and he gave her a few thousand dollars to pay for baby stuff, but told her not to contact him again. That is when she understood their friendship. So she went after him for child support. His fiancé found out about the whole thing and is thinking of breaking things off. The child support is enough that the baby will be taken care of and will not affect our finances. He called her crying because we messed up his life. He said that I could easily afford to take care of them and that I'm being a jerk for dragging his life through the mud. She feels terrible about it and blames me for not just stepping up and considering her as a single mom. I love my girlfriend and the baby and I have no problem raising the baby but I don't think I should be held financially responsible when the father has resources and tried to evade responsibility. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. It's good that you're willing to be a family with your girlfriend and her baby, and according to you, you could afford to support them, but that does not absolve the biological father of responsibility for the maintenance of his kid. And what if, God forbid, something happened to you and you cannot afford it anymore? What happens then? If the biological dad had a few thousand available to give away like that, I'm guessing he can afford to as well. So the ruined part is of his own doing, since he lied to his fiance and hoped to forget the whole thing. OP, I can afford it, but yes, I think that the biological father has to support his kid. I actually plan to talk to my girlfriend about putting most of the child support into an investment fund for the kid's future, education or what have you. I will support our family and the kid will have a great nest egg to start life. Not the jerk. He's the father. He should be responsible. However, if she's going through her finances without thinking about her responsibilities and she initially tried to pin the baby on you, is that not a red flag of potential issues that may crop up? Red flags. Proceed with caution, OP. I suspect you're in for a bumpy road ahead. I totally understand the this guy fathered this kid and needs to step up and the way you pressured your girlfriend to go to him, and you're not the jerk for that. But I'm kind of wondering where you're planning to go from here. If you're going to raise the kid as your own, and it sounds like you are, you can't realistically keep up the, I'm not taking financial responsibility for it in the long run. Even legally speaking, in most countries, if you're dad, for all practical intents and purposes, even if you aren't on paper, you'll be asked to step up if necessary. You're the jerk. You sound just like my ex. He was willing to man up and financially support my twins until he heard through the grapevine that they might not be his. Well, this loser actually demanded a paternity test and surprise, surprise, he wasn't the father. He flipped when he found out I had cheated on him and the truth is, yes, I did cheat, but only because he was always trying to control me. If you ask me, controlling men deserve to be cheated on and I have no regrets for the other guys that I was with. I have no idea which one was the actual father and he kept trying to make me go after them for child support. Never gonna happen though, because most of them are my guy friends, and I don't want to damage that friendship. I feel so sorry for your girlfriend, and I hope she finds a real man who will step up and be a father to her baby, since you're obviously too selfish and delusional to be an actual man with your fragile little ego. My wife keeps going to the movies with the man who lives next door and makes me babysit. I'm 39, male. My wife, 34, female and I live in a suburban house with our daughter, who's 10, Emily. Our neighbor next door, 48 male, is Walter. He's a single father with two daughters who are 14 and 12. We've been living here for a little more than two years. 
My wife really likes watching scary movies, but I never enjoy them. I get too scared and end up having a bad time, so I prefer to avoid them. Her friends sometimes go with her to the more popular ones, but she also likes older, indies, and foreign horror movies. She has always had a hard time finding people that have this niche interest, and that's why it was such a big deal when we met Walter and found out that he also shares this tendency. They very quickly started to make plans to watch movies together. I was invited to be a part of this, but I refused. I prefer to just stay at home babysitting Emily and Walter's daughters. Sometimes they go to movie theaters, but other times they just stay at Walter's place watching stuff at his home cinema. They usually have to go to another town in order to catch a specific function of some weird movie, so it's normal for them to come back very late. They eventually started doing stuff outside of watching movies, like going out for dinner. Walter invited all of us, including the kids, to go with him to a restaurant that a friend of his owned but I said no because it was too expensive. I don't like that kind of place because I feel that they're a waste of money and I didn't think the kids would enjoy it either. I insisted on staying with the kids and let the two of them go be themselves. This has become a regular thing and it's now in a way a good deal for me because Walter pays for my wife's dinner and she can't no longer complain about me not taking her to fancy restaurants. As both their movie and dinner nights had become so common, I've grown a little tired of the burden of constantly babysitting. I talked to my wife and Walter about it and he explained that he usually does not like leaving his daughters with babysitters. He says he's really comfortable knowing that they're being watched by an experienced father like me instead of some teenager. He nevertheless agreed that it was too much of a load for me and offered to start paying me a standard babysitter fee each time he goes out with my wife. I thought that was a fair approach to the issue, but my wife was fully against it. She says I should not be paid for babysitting my own daughter nor the daughters of a close friend and our family like Walter. We've been arguing about this, but she insists on this notion and it's not open to change. She even gets mad every time I talk to her about it. Walter promised me that he will convince her, but he does not seem to have been able to do so either. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk for several reasons, two of which are calling taking care of your own kid babysitting and not really caring about your marriage. Don't be surprised if your wife ends up leaving you for Walter, if they're not already having an affair. I'm sorry, OP, but it looks like your wife has a new husband, and somehow you're the babysitter. I kept reading this thinking this must be a joke. You're the jerk for asking for babysitting money, but this whole situation is so bizarre. I think you need to figure out if you want to be married and if she does, because right now it doesn't seem like you are. To clarify, there is absolutely nothing wrong with having a friend of the opposite gender who shares a hobby. The issue is, OP is refusing to participate in any aspect of his wife's interests or fill her romantic needs, letting Walter fill the whole vacuum of his neglect. Won't compromise and join them on any of the movies, even infrequently. Won't take his wife to a nice dinner because he thinks treating his wife to something nice occasionally is a waste of money. Insists on staying home when invited to join in non-scary movie activities, then whines about babysitting, doesn't suggest any alternative group activities that they all might enjoy. So judging by the content of this post, he's just encouraging his wife to go to Walter for all of her emotional and social needs. No way that could ever backfire. Your wife is dating your neighbor and you think he should pay you? Oh man, you're the jerk. Walter and your wife might have a common interest, but they've tried to involve you in things outside of that, like going out to eat and you refused. And now you're complaining about sitting at home and moping and babysitting, which you chose to do? Also ticking the box of taking your wife out for a nice dinner by letting someone else do it? You're the jerk. You're the jerk for basically outsourcing your wife to the neighbor. You don't like scary movies, okay. But to then say that it's great that another man is taking your wife to what is basically dates so you don't have to? The answer is to try to engage in your wife's interests and find stuff you two can do together not to start taking a salary to watch the kids. You're the jerk. It's not babysitting, it's being a parent. Also, are you aware you're pushing your wife into the arms of another man? You're the jerk, and you're basically asking your wife's boyfriend to pay you so he can date her. My wife commented about me on a Reddit post, and I don't know if I can get over what she said. Today I found a post from my wife. Actually, it was a response to a post. The post was, if you could tell your younger self something from five years ago, what would it be? My wife's comment was, don't have a second kid and get divorced. It really broke me reading that. 
I know we're going through a really rough patch. We both aren't perfect, but that's something that just broke me. It's sad because now I feel nothing. I'm not angry. I'm not sad. I'm not resentful. I just feel nothing. What do I do? We're already in marriage counseling and single therapy as well. Reddit should really be anonymous. That's kind of the whole point. If she knew he was on Reddit and she posted it on her main account, then she wanted him to find it. Do you want to get divorced? If so, pull the plug. If not, do the work and fix your marriage. OP, I've been trying for months. She's the one fighting back, saying stuff about how she wants to find herself and explore. But after reading that, I don't know if I want to be with her anymore. That's understandable. That would be a gut punch to read. Maybe tell her that you saw it and go from there. Can't really get much worse. OP, I actually did. I told her that she has a week to change my mind and to pray for a miracle. But I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I have to worry about my kids too, not just me. It doesn't sound like she wants to be with you if she's not making an effort to stay with you and posted that. I think giving her an ultimatum just speeds up her exit. Or maybe it will wake her up and realize that this isn't what she actually wants. Update. For all of you who are angry that I gave my wife an ultimatum, I should have said that she had already given me an ultimatum two months ago. Not going to go into what hers was. So on to what happened. I did confront her and that night we had a fight. After going back and forth, I finally asked her what she wanted. This is where she broke down and started crying. She said she didn't want to get divorced and her comment was impulsive and she regretted it. She was hurt that I was giving her one-worded responses. She texted me because she was lonely and depressed. I told her I was in the bathroom and I was sorry she felt like I was ignoring her, but I wasn't. So after a lot of talking and forgiving each other, because I'm not perfect either, and we've both made mistakes in the past, we're not going to get divorced. We are going to work on getting better for each other and for our kids. Our first marriage counseling was yesterday and I have some big issues I need to take care of to be a better husband. She does too. We're not out of the woods yet, but we're heading in the right direction. I gave her an ultimatum because she gave me one two months ago that kept changing. First was she needs to see a change in me and when she did see that change, it morphed into, well, I need to feel a spark in me or I'm leaving. Should have mentioned that. By exploring, she wanted to date other men. I was her first in everything and she feels like she missed out on a lot. I think she said what she said out of spite and being impulsive. She was hurt and angry because I was giving her one word responses. I was in the middle of going to the bathroom when she was texting me. Update. I'm going to show you guys a text conversation and I want your opinion. Note, this guy started talking to my wife a month ago. This guy is from the UK. And for context, my wife was telling him how she was really tired of not being able to sleep that night and has bags under her eyes. My wife. It's going boring. I have such giant bags under my eyes. I want to collapse into bed. But after... Guy. That sounds so tiring. I want to be chilling. Come and chill with me. My hubs and both kids would be coming with me. I don't know if you'd want all those visitors. Haha, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I can make some sacrifices to make you a little happier. Wow, thanks. I mean, I wouldn't do those things, but that doesn't make me delicate. Okay, maybe delicate is the wrong word then. How about gentle? I mean, that's better, but I could totally handle you. I mean, I'm only one rambunctious American. I don't think you could handle four. I think I could, honestly. Oh, the bravado of youth. I think you underestimate me. OP, shut this down. This guy's a snake. OP, after a talk, she blocked him. This dude is trying to get with your wife. The bigger question is, why is your wife entertaining conversations like this? OP, she's oblivious when guys flirt with her. She thinks that they're just being nice. You haven't answered the question that was asked by several people. What is the nature of the relationship between your wife and this guy who is obviously trying to get with her? How does she know him? OP, she met him as a friend. She likes talking to people from other cultures and parts of the world. They've known each other for a couple of weeks. She only thought of him as a friend. This marriage is a hot mess. I'm exhausted by your marriage and I don't even know you guys. Imagine being in it. Can't wait for the divorced update with both sides benefiting from it. That story just like made me mad. What a bad marriage. Dang. Am I the jerk for telling my son that his girlfriend is taking advantage of him? My son, Lucas, who's 19, has been dating Maya, who's 19, for a year. Just some background. I'm a single mom and Lucas' dad is extremely wealthy. Just a minor example of this is that his dad owns the entire block that Lucas lives on. 
Lucas has a job at his dad's company, making close to $200,000 per year while only working 20 hours a week. Maya is not from a well-off family. She's been on her own since she was 16, and she had just had enough to be okay before she met my son. She refused most of my son's help, but she let him do little things, like help pay for her car repairs and better groceries. Then she got pregnant. Apparently, the first couple of months were very rough, so she had to quit her job. Then her car wasn't safe enough for a baby. She had to move in with him. Due to complications, she lost it at six months. She was in and out of the hospital for the first month, but it's been over seven months now, and she still lives with him, doesn't work, and barely contributes with household chores. I tried to tell Lucas during and after the pregnancy that Maya was milking it. I got pregnant with him when I was Maya's age and I made it just fine on my own. I still worked, went to school, took care of my apartment, and later raised a kid all on my own. I think Maya saw an opportunity to get out of her old living situation and she took it. He's always refused to believe me and the last time I tried to talk some sense into him, he told me if I can't respect Maya, he won't be in contact with me. It's been two weeks and I'm wondering if I should have kept my mouth shut. Maya has done nothing to indicate that she's just after your son's money and would probably be good for your son, as your son seems to have everything handed to him. You're just projecting your own insecurities on a totally innocent person. You're the jerk. Maybe you're the devil. OP. It's been seven months. There's no reason for her to not be working or helping around the house. Update. A lot has changed in the past three months. First, Maya and Lucas moved. I've seen pictures of their house on social media. It's gorgeous. Shortly after they moved, I saw that they are now engaged. I have not been invited to the wedding. I know some of my family members have been invited, but they're not allowed to tell me where or when the wedding is. Between family and social media, I can tell that they're doing very well. My son is finishing his final semester in college. He did dual enrollment starting from sophomore year and graduated high school a semester early. Maya just started a small business and they got two dogs and some chickens. Maya and Lucas posted a pregnancy announcement today. Maya is 14 weeks pregnant. I called Lucas and left a message congratulating him and asking to meet up. I sent Maya a similar message. As of now, it looks like I will not be involved in my grandkids' life. I'd love to know what other stuff the OP is getting up to, because this reads like son goes no contact very quickly. I expect that he's been having issues with his mom like this for a long time. The New Fence A few years ago, I was building a new fence for a friend of mine. I had to remove the old sections that were falling apart, and when I got to the intersection of his back fence and the next door neighbor's back fence, I carefully separated the neighbor's fence from his and proceeded to carry on removing the side sections that went between their two properties. My friend had told me that the side section was 100% on his property and that the previous owner, 30 years ago, had deliberately given the next door neighbor's property an extra foot or so to ensure that he was building on his own property without calling for and paying for a survey. The neighbor, Susan, whom I will refer to as Karen for the rest of this story, came running outside screaming at me that I couldn't remove this side fence and it was their property and just what do I think I'm doing? I responded back very calmly that my friend had just told them well in advance that he was going to replace the fence, that he was just going to build it in the same place as the old one and asked if they were willing to split the costs, to which they declined. No biggie. Karen started screaming at me again, telling me I had no right to do that and that my friend didn't give them proper notice, and that she didn't realize that there wouldn't be anything between their two properties to contain their dog. By now, I'm about ready to lose my mind, so I knocked on my friend's back door to let him know what was going on, and that he needed to go talk to Karen, and that I was leaving because I didn't want to do or say anything I would regret, or cause problems with the neighbors for my friend. The entire project got put on hold, pending a property survey that was going to cost $650, and that they demanded my friend pay half of, despite him telling them that the fence was definitely on his property and nothing was going to change with the new fence, and that he was fine with them continuing to have a foot or so of his property, so that he didn't have to rock the boat. Fast forward to the following Monday when the surveyor comes out. Turns out the old side fence was not a little on my friend's property, but almost 10 feet onto his property, and the neighbors had built up raised flower beds and done a nice brick retaining wall right up to the fence line that they had spent a lot of money just in materials for, never mind the time they spent constructing it. Needless to say, my friend was very pleased with this. For the mere price of $325, he was entitled to expand his yard of more than 30 years by about 800 square feet, 
and Karen and her husband, who happened to be the polar opposite of his wife in personality and was super nice, spent the next week moving their garden, retaining wall, and all of the dirt that was on my friend's property, so that I could build a fence on his side of the actual property line. Then they hired the cheapest contractors they could find to slap up a fence on their side of the property line. They spent almost as much as my friend did on their new fence. I gave my friend the friends and family discount. Three years later, the last 20 feet or so of their fence is on the ground already because it was such a bad job and it fell over in a moderate windstorm this past spring. My friend's fence is still standing, rock solid, and his dogs are definitely making good use of the extra 800 square feet. My boyfriend disappeared every weekend for the past three years and I just found out that he's been lying to me about it. My boyfriend, who's 27 male, and I, 24 female, have been together for three years. We don't live together, but we're close enough to spend a lot of time together. However, it's very rare for us to spend a whole day together. When we have, it's been a weekday where our schedules have just happened to line up, like no work and no class. We have never spent a day on the weekend together. He works as a research assistant while getting his PhD. Every single weekend for the past three years we've been together, he insists he has to work. I realize how stupid I've been now, but foolishly I trusted him. I trusted that he had work every single weekend for three years. That was until today. I've been studying for finals and it's the toughest it's ever been, so I was craving some time with him. Just a day where we could kick back and relax with each other. Of course, he says he can't because he's working and I shut up about it. So today I'm getting antsy anyway and hoping we could at least spend the evening together. I end up texting him, asking him when he thinks he'll be back and we can spend the night. I've done this plenty of times before and he always responds fairly quickly. This time I'm waiting for a while. After two hours, I decide to text a work friend of his who's also a research assistant with him. Wouldn't you know it, it turns out they don't have work today. In fact, he informs me in the same text that they rarely ever have work on the weekends. So now I'm sitting here wondering what's going on. I have no idea how to confront him about this. I mean, this has been going on for three years. If he's cheating on me, he basically has a second family at this point. But obviously, that's where my mind goes and I have no clue what else could be happening. Like, is there any possible explanation for this besides cheating? How in the world do I confront him about something he's been doing for three years? Since he's doing whatever it is tomorrow, do I just drive over to his place in the morning and wait and then follow him? Has anyone had anything like this happen to them before? Do you spend any holidays together? Celebrate your birthdays together? Have you met his friends or his parents? Do you give each other gifts? Have you had discussions about living together or the future? So many questions that the answers could give a better understanding of your relationship. At this stage, the final exams are what matters the most, and you should try to focus on that. The future X is a waste of space, and it sucks you had to find out this way. I hope you don't let him impact your professional future. I'm sending all the wishes of success your way. OP, there are so many examples of men leading double lives where they have two families. Guess what reason they used to excuse it? Work. That's the cover-up basically every single time. I know it sounds absolutely insane, bonkers and impossible. That's because to us saying decent people, it is. But the people capable of lying and deceiving like this aren't like us, and they take advantage of the knowledge that we can't even fathom such a thing. It helps them get away with their lie and keep it going. Think about it. Really, the only plausible explanation that he's away for work literally every single weekend for three years is because he's leading a double life. Only a family life with another woman and kids makes sense for such a long-term, habitual pattern. You've tolerated a relationship for years where you don't even spend an entire day together. To him, you're the perfect side piece since you're willing to tolerate that for so long without questioning it or putting your foot down. You're in denial and I don't blame you. I would be too initially. You know this smells fishy and it is. Knowing myself, I would get crafty and find a way to discover the truth, get proof, and let the other woman know. Best of luck to you. So many examples of men leading double lives? Gee, maybe you should stop going for the guys who will lie to you and cheat on you. But all guys do that. Yeah, all the ones who look like Brad Pitt. Maybe start giving average looking dudes a chance. Chill guys who like video games and don't go to the gym every day. Stop friend zoning us and seeing us as brothers and actually try having a relationship with us. Edit. Call me a nice guy all you want. Every girl that's ever turned me down has gone on to date guys that treated her horribly. Then she'd complain to me about it because we're still friends and expect me to listen to it and help her feel better. 
As soon as I mention that if she were with me, I would never treat you like this, she gets mad, starts ignoring me, every time. Don't you just love when Reddit commenters go on these long rants about their own lives and it has nothing to do with the story? <laughs> Am I the jerk for telling my stepmom she's pathetic and doesn't get to boss my mom around? My parents divorced when I, 15 male, was 5 and my sister was 3. For a while, during and post-divorce, my dad was trying really hard to win my mom back. I remember he would use how upset my sister and I were about the divorce. For me, it was hard to go from our family being together to two separate homes and families. For my sister, the upheaval was hard for her. She really couldn't get used to bouncing from home to home. Throughout all of that, mom did her best to shield us, and even though she must have hated my dad's guts for all the stunts he pulled, she kept some photos of him and our family from before up in the house. My sister and I felt reassured seeing them. Even though she didn't remember those times, I think it made her feel a little more okay with how confusing it was, and dad only made it worse. Dad gave up on them getting back together eventually, and he insisted that everything we had at his house be from him and not mom, and we could not have photos of mom in the home. I was eight when he met my stepmom. I'm not sure how soon she found out that mom still had photos up of before it became a huge deal for her, and she told my mom she was not allowed to have photos of her man up in the house. My mom remarried when I was 10. We have a few photos of my stepdad's ex-wife at home, and some from when he was married to her and my step-siblings were young. This is especially important to them because their mom is terminally ill with a condition that made her unable to take care of them. I think it's something to do with her brain. There are still photos of dad at mom's too. I'm less into it now that I feel worse about what dad did, but my sister still feels comforted by them and mom always says he is still our dad and our family and she wants it to be as much our home as it is everyone else's who lives there. The wall where these photos are is where mom takes a lot of our back-to-school photos. My stepmom found out they were still up and went nuts on my mom a few months ago. She told mom she had to do what she says, etc. It was insane. My mom told her to mind her business and if she stays out of her house, she doesn't have to see them or worry about them. My stepmom went on a rant about mom a few days ago and she was like, How dare your mom not do what I tell her and take the photos of my husband down. I told my stepmom she's pathetic for being so bothered that my mom was a good enough mom to accept photos of dad for our sake and that she doesn't get to boss my mom around. I also told her to leave my mom alone because none of this had anything to do with her. She told me I did not get to speak to her that way. I told her if she thinks she's earning my respect with her crap, then she's even more pathetic than I thought. It's been a rough few days. My dad and stepmom both say I was beyond disrespectful. Am I the jerk? Something tells me that your dad is not the nicest person in the world based on your post. Your mom clearly isn't interested in winning him back and just wanted to give you and your sister some comfort when you were younger. Just like having photos of your mom's husband's ex-wife makes your step-siblings feel better, especially given that their mom is terminal. Your mom sounds like a very secure and kind person who just wants the best for her biological and her stepkids. Your stepmother, on the other hand, not the jerk. Karen stole my cat so I stole her back. I got pebbles from a humane society when she was two months old. I love her with my whole heart. She's now five years old, soon to be six. 14 months ago, I had to move to an apartment that didn't allow pets in the contract. I had no choice but to rehome pebbles and I was heartbroken. But my grandma ended up taking her from me, so it wasn't so bad because I could visit pebbles anytime. She was safe in a house, all indoors and well taken care of. Three months ago, grandma passed. And of course, that was hard enough, but on top of that, Pebbles got grabbed without anyone's consulting me and brought to my uncle and aunt's house to live. They put her outside with their other farm cats. I drove out on my day off to see her, and she was looking scared and bedraggled, but they insisted that she was fine. I went home heartbroken and I was angry. Recently, I was able to move into a better apartment that's pet-friendly with a roommate. I asked if I could have Pebbles back, but my aunt said no. That my cousins, who are 15 and 18, have grown attached. But frankly, oh well. So I said, fine, okay. Then last week during work hours, I took off on my lunch break, drove to the farm while they were at work and school, found Pebbles, put her in my car, and drove home to my new apartment. It took them two days to even figure out that she was gone. Then, of course, my aunt called me and asked if I had taken Pebbles. I said yes. She started to yell, so I just said, she's my cat, and I gave her to grandma for a while, 
not you. And then I hung up. I think I'm legally in the clear here because I took Pebbles back to the vet I took her to her whole life for a checkup, got her papers up to date, got her microchipped and put her in my name. But my parents called me and told me that they were disappointed in me, that it was immature to steal Pebbles and that the girls are apparently heartbroken. I'm sorry my cousins are sad, but I would do it again. Pebbles is my cat and they weren't taking care of her correctly. I never wanted to give her up anyway. If I'm the jerk, that's fine. Not the jerk. Sounds more like you rescued your cat to me. Yes, putting a cat that's grown up indoors outdoors with other cats who are used to being outdoors is cruel. Cats are territorial and were probably quite hard on your cat. Not to mention that outdoor cats have a significantly shorter life expectancy than an indoor cat. OP did the right thing. She rescued Pebbles and getting her chipped and vetted right away was exactly the right move. OP, I'm so glad you have your kitty back. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for taking money from my wife's account to pay for my computer that she broke? My wife is a stay-at-home mom. She works hard taking care of our kids and maintaining our home. I do what we have agreed is a fair portion of the housework and all of the yard work. She has full access to all of our accounts except for my personal spending account. I put the exact same amount into her personal spending account, but I can only deposit, not withdraw. I have a home office, but I don't work from home. It's just a place I can go to sit and catch up on anything I might need to work from home on and also play video games or play with my toys. My wife also has a room that's dedicated to her and her hobbies. I've asked her multiple times to please leave my room alone. I clean it myself, I take my dishes to the kitchen and either wash them or place them in the dishwasher. I take out my own trash. When I play with my kids in my office, I clean up after all of us. When my wife joins me in my office for video games, I clean up afterwards. There's quite literally no reason for her to do anything in there when I am not in it. I do not have a lock on my door, but I do have my laptop password protected. I like to line up some of my collection of Lego minifigures by my screen on my laptop. I like to imagine that Batman and Spider-Man are watching me work. I know it's silly, but I like it. For some reason, my wife decided to go clean my office. I guess she needed to move my laptop, so she closed it. Not all the way, because my minifigures were in the way. When I came home, she told me what had happened. The screen was not working at all. I had to get my old monitor out and hook it up so I could check and see if anything else was busted. It was just the screen. I checked and it would cost about $250 for parts and labor to replace my screen. So I decided to replace the laptop and use the old one with my old monitor for the kids. It was fine other than the non-working screen. The cost to replace my laptop was only $600. Yay, Black Friday. So I took $350 from my account and I took $250 from the money I was going to deposit into her personal account for December and I got my new computer. This will in no way affect our budget for anything other than our own personal side projects and hobbies. I was looking forward to getting myself a new Lego set to work on with my kids over the holidays, but now I will have to rebuild one of my old ones with them, which is also fun. Well, now she's upset at me because she has to cut back on her fun stuff for December. She likes to have a spa day with her mom, for example. I said that I wasn't responsible for my computer being broken and that she 100% was. She said it was an accident and that I should forgive her. I said I wasn't upset, but that if she felt I should forgive her, then I fully forgive her, but she still has to help me pay for a new laptop. Am I the jerk? I did not just take her money. We talked about it first. She is still upset that I expect her to take responsibility. I did not make an unfair decision. We do not work that way. I think you are a bit of a jerk. She's a stay-at-home parent. She does not earn money that can be saved up for things like spa days with her mother. She relies on those funds that are budgeted for personal fun. It feels to me like you're treating her like a kid. How would you feel if you accidentally broke something she valued and she insisted you pay for it? If she had broken it intentionally, it would be one thing, but it was an accident and she was trying to be helpful by cleaning your office. It really does sound like a jerk move to me. You're the jerk. You sound like you're punishing a kid by withholding their allowance, not talking with your wife. Grow up. Stuff happens. You're in a marriage and a partnership. Don't pretend you didn't take her money and aren't a jerk. That's exactly what you are. You didn't talk about it and mutually agree. She clearly does not agree. At best, you bullied her into giving into your childish and petty demands. Enjoy those Legos. They're going to cost you way more than a few hundred bucks.
You're the jerk. Stop treating your wife like a kid. What on earth? If losing $250 is not going to affect your life, then what's the point of treating your wife like this? Like honestly, this seems like a misuse of power. I'd bet money that losing $250 means more to your wife than it does to you. Just wow. Sometimes people can be so trash. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. New job, bait and switch. I worked for a national home improvement store, the blue one. When I interviewed, I applied for the sales position in plumbing, no longer exists. It was Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, with a commission program. Since I had years of plumbing experience, I was offered the job. The day I started, I was told the sales job went to an internal promotion. Only thing they could offer me was part-time, lower hourly rate, no commission, had to work alternating weekends. I was young and had a new baby, so I said sure, as long as I could go full-time in a few months with weekends off. My manager agreed. Fast forward three months, not a word has been said. The guy who got the sales job, an electrician, asked me questions about plumbing all day. I asked my department manager about full-time, a sales job, anything. Sorry, nothing available. I reminded him of what I was hired for, the schedule I was promised, the pay I was originally offered. DM, if you don't like it, look for another job. Jobs at the time were hard to come by, but a job that was available, in that store even, was a stocking job. This position was always available as the pay wasn't great and it was a lot of physical work, but the hours were Monday through Friday full time, so I applied for that. When I interviewed, my manager found out. He went to HR to stop me from transferring. I informed HR that if the position didn't get filled and I was excluded from transferring, I would filter a complaint, so I got the job. Fast forward two months and the quarter ends. No actual plumber in the department meant sales dropped so manager didn't get his bonus. He now begs me to come back. No thanks, I'm making more money on Saturday doing side jobs than I made Monday through Friday. So he asks, what can I do to get you back in plumbing? I give him a ridiculous price. He laughs and says, that's more than I make. Oh well. Fast forward three more months, store manager doesn't get her bonus because plumbing hasn't made budget in two quarters in a row. Time to fix the problem. I get called into a meeting with store manager and department manager. Store manager, what will it take to get you back in plumbing? Me, stupid salary. DM, I told you, not reasonable. Store manager, give us a minute, please. I stand up to leave and store manager, oh no, I'm sorry. I meant department manager should leave. Department manager, surprised Pikachu face. Store manager, if I pay you that, you'll have to work weekends. We're busiest on weekends. Me. I'll do Saturday. With every Sunday and Monday off. No rotating days off like before. I get my commission back. Store manager. Done. You cannot talk about your rate. I'm the only person in the store making more than this. Me. Well, I can, but I won't. The look on department manager's face when we came out was priceless. If he had only given me the job I was hired for originally. But I am the manager. I'm the AGM at a recently opened hotel in my city. I wear the fancy suit, have the fancy name tag, it's magnetic, and definitely don't look like a guest staying there. But I'm also the only member of the team who wears a suit over a generic uniform. We had a woman, I'm estimating mid to late 60s, come in and was snooping around, so needless to say, I approached to ask if I could help her. She said she was just wanting to see the pool. I explained that our pool is closed and still under construction. The door next to the pool itself is blocked off with a coming soon sign. Lady, I saw that online, but I just wanted to see it. You know how sometimes things say one thing online and another in person? Hotels really don't keep up on that stuff. Me, I'm aware that this is sometimes the case, but I assure you, madam, the pool is closed and still under construction. We are excited and hopeful to see it open in January. Lady, is there someone I can talk to? I really want to take my granddaughter here over Christmas to use the pool. Me. I'm the AGM here actually, and unfortunately, as I said, the pool isn't expected to be open until the new year. There literally, physically, is no pool right now. Lady goes up to the FDA and asks about the pool and booking to use it over Christmas. FDA says, slightly confused, as my manager, gestures to me, explained, the pool won't be open. Lady looks back at me, 
then back at FDA. Is there a manager I can speak to? Again, my name tag literally says manager in fun bold letters. Me. Madam, I am the assistant general manager. And in fact, the current acting general manager. The actual general manager was away aiding with another property opening. Lady looks at the FDA. I just don't understand. Why can't I speak to the manager? Me and FDA exchange a confused look. Me. Madam, I assure you, I am the only manager on the property. Lady. I can't believe this. I want to speak to a manager. Me again. I am the manager. I said I want to speak to the manager. Me again, more forcefully. Madam, I am the manager. I'm the one you want to speak to. Lady turns to front desk agent. Call the manager right now. This service is so unacceptable. I just want to bring my granddaughter to use the pool over Christmas. Me. Madam, again, I am the manager. And as I've repeatedly told you, we do not have a pool that will be available over Christmas. There is no pool. Lady gets angrier. Why didn't you just say that? It says you have a pool online. This is not acceptable. I'm going to speak to the manager and get you all fired. Me. At this point, I'm Ryle Reynolds done with this. Sure, please do. I'll be more than happy to fire myself, then collect severance for unlawful termination. It will make for a great Christmas bonus. I'll take my wife and kid to Fiji. Lady, red in the face. Your manager will hear from me. How dare you ruin my granddaughter's Christmas. I'll make sure to tell everyone you won't let anyone use your pool. The lady then stormed out. I recognize the lady may be in her early stages of something serious, but in the entire interaction, she was very clear-minded. I don't think I've ever had anyone so forcefully deny my existence like this before. Am I the jerk for watching TV while my daughter eats dinner? I have a two-year-old daughter. Most days, my wife feeds her breakfast, I feed her dinner. She mostly feeds herself, but we watch her to make sure she doesn't spill stuff all over or if she has any requests. I love my daughter. I would like that to be clear. She's my favorite person in the world. I spend a ton of time every day horsing around with her, teaching her letters and numbers, reading books. I put her to bed every other night, brush her teeth, etc. I spend a lot of quality time with her in my opinion. However, she is very boring to watch eat. It takes her about 30 minutes, what amounts to maybe one and a half cups of food and drink her milk. She spends about half the time playing with her fork, singing the alphabet, or blathering nonsense. We are also trying to be mindful of using electronics around or in front of her. In particular, no phones at the dinner table. About a week ago, I was preparing dinner with my AirPods in and realized that I could continue listening to music and podcasts while I was watching her eat, to make it at least a little more interesting. The other day, I decided to stick my phone in the napkin holder on the table so my daughter couldn't see it and watch Netflix. I thought this was genius. I only have one AirPod in so I can still hear everything she says. I still am keeping an eye on her. I'm still sitting in front of her, looking in her general direction, but I'm watching TV. Now, instead of dreading dinner time, I'm fine with it. Anyway, yesterday, my wife came home with my mother-in-law and caught me watching TV. When she came in, I pointed to the AirPod, then to the phone and gave a thumbs up, thinking she too would think I'm a genius. Well, my wife's not happy. I'm not sure if it's her or it's her mom who was really not happy, but she thinks I should be spending that time with my daughter. I think I am. I think my daughter is completely unaware that I'm watching TV, so no harm, no foul. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk, slightly. Dinner time shouldn't be essentially a solitary experience where you're at the table with family. At two, not everything she says is blathering nonsense. Most parents would use this time with the kid to encourage discussion about the food, about the day, whatever. It's not too young to teach her about socializing over a meal. And we're talking about half an hour for you. Make an effort here. I kind of sympathize with OP, but this is what you signed up for when you have a kid. Perhaps something more interactive could help. Like, for example, if you feel bored watching her eat, maybe you can read both of you guys a story while she eats. That way it's more of an interactive experience and you won't be too bored. Maybe you can make up a story yourself and tell it, etc. Talk to your kid while they're eating. Open up a conversation, albeit mostly one-sided. Show interest in your kid. Quality time. You're the jerk. Your daughter is interacting, watching your facial expressions, talking to you, and eating. Yes, it is the most boring thing ever, but your being part of it is important for her development. 
Not the jerk at all. Single mom of a two and a half year old. Having her chatter to herself while eating is completely normal and she would be doing the exact same thing if she was at nursery. If you're spending quality time with her during the day, you've met her needs and for that period of time, you can meet your own. These comments are absolutely absurd. I spend all day either caring for my little one or at work. When it gets to dinner time is the only time I can get some uninterrupted studying time. Some people think dinner time is the most sacred thing in the world because they spend so much time away from their family for the majority of the day, but for many, it can be the opposite. You're the jerk for making a post and then arguing with everyone because you don't like the judgment. Meal times are great times to interact with your kid. And yes, I do realize they go on about all kinds of nonsense. I have a two and a half year old who plays really well independently, but there are certain times where giving them your attention matters. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Karen steals a house and her family congratulates her, but I taught her a lesson. I want to get along with everyone, but my wife's extended family is full of some really bad people. They're perfectly nice to everyone's faces, but no sense of morals. They're the kind of people that think that scamming and stealing is a legit way to get ahead in the world and be an accomplishment. For an example, one of my wife's uncles chose gaming over working during his marriage and when his wife divorced him for cheating on her, he won alimony and half of our money, which totaled to over $500,000. After he got it, he bragged and everyone congratulated him on becoming financially stable. Those kinds of people. Of course, my wife loves her family, so we see them frequently. I'm trying to raise my kids to have actual morals, so I try to counteract the lessons they're learning from that side whenever I see it. The big news at Thanksgiving was that one of my wife's cousins, Tia, and her husband just became homeowners for the first time this year. She and her husband are young, so there were a lot of questions, and the story was recounted. Well, her husband's grandma passed. She had left the house to her kids to split, but her lawyer father-in-law figured out a loophole to take the entire house for just his son, and he had him jump on it before the rest of the family even had a chance to know about it. He wanted to help out his son, so he paid the entire cost to make it happen as a wedding gift, and to be able to do over his ex-wife and her siblings, no doubt. Per usual, everyone was congratulating them. I tried to have a side conversation with my kids to make sure they knew that they really stole the house, and that wasn't right. It was overheard and started a whole thing about how it wasn't Tia's fault and what did I expect her to do. I'm willing to give that it's a little bit of an exception, because while it was actively being done, she didn't even know anything about it because she was in the psych ward at the time, but she does now, and she's certainly reaping the benefits. If something you want to not be complicit in happens, you have to do something to go against it. You don't get to go, it wasn't my fault, and therefore I don't have any responsibility here, while you waltz around your free house every day, still cuddling up to the person that stole it. Everyone accused me of bullying her when I know she's vulnerable, and being too hard on her for just trying to be a good wife and survive when I know she's had a hard time. And they think that this is such a good break for her, so why can't I just be happy for her? I wanted to keep the peace, so I said that we see things differently, and I told my wife I was leaving and would pick her up when she was ready. After I left, Tia apparently had a panic attack and had to be calmed down, and now I'm enemy number one and they all want an apology. I don't want to give one, because I'm not in the wrong. Is this really something that I'm supposed to be okay with? Unless you want your kids to grow up to be just like them, this is definitely the hill to die on. You need to have a conversation with your spouse about how you don't want her family's low morals spreading to your kids, but do so calmly and give her a chance to explain her side without interruptions. Once she has, ask her to allow you to explain yourself in a similar fashion. Make sure to try and cite examples of situations you don't agree with and how you're worried this will affect your growing perception of your kids. Also, ask how she would feel if her family felt they could get ahead at your expense. Because if they think conning a family out of rightful inheritance is brilliant, then they probably wouldn't think twice about doing you over for the sake of your spouse. If she fails to see any of your points, I'd make sure you have one heck of a lawyer that you can trust. As to the cousin's panic attack, not your problem. She better get used to people outside the family thinking she and her husband are scum, because they are. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for exposing my ex-girlfriend to her fiancé? I, 26 male, dated my ex-girlfriend in high school when we were both 16. I'd had a crush on her since we were little, so when she finally agreed to go out with me in high school, I was over the moon. Unfortunately, our relationship was a nightmare. 
I quickly realized she had low self-esteem, constantly asked for reassurance from me about her looks and weight, and if I didn't tell her exactly what she wanted to hear, she would gaslight and manipulate me to make me feel guilty. I didn't realize at the time, but after reading stuff online and listening to podcasts, I realized her behavior was not acceptable. We dated for around one year, and she ended up breaking up with me, citing her mental health, etc. I never saw her after high school because we moved to different cities and also her social media accounts were set to private. Recently, there was a high school reunion. I found out she would be there, so I decided to go. She hadn't changed much, still looks the same. She said hi to me as if nothing had happened and proceeded to make small talk with me. It really bothered me that she was pretending nothing happened between us, so I asked if we could talk privately. I told her about how I felt about the way she treated me when we were dating. She said something like she was going through a tough time with her self-confidence and apologized for taking it out on me, etc. Said ever since she met her current partner, she was feeling more confident about herself. She then told me they were engaged, which also came as a shock to me. I asked her if she had told him about us and how she treated me when we were dating. She said she mentioned her past relationships to him, but didn't share all the details. I told her she needs to tell him about how she was towards me so that he knows who he's marrying. At this point, she made, she made up some excuse and ran away from the conversation. I felt that the new partner should know what he's getting into. She still looks the same and has not made any effort to change or improve herself and probably has the same insecurities, and I imagine how this man will have a terrible marriage. So after the party, I used a friend's account to find her fiancé, and I sent him a message detailing the things she did when we were dating in high school. <laughs> he responded with something like, asking me to stop bothering them, whatever that's supposed to mean. It's been about a week since I did this, and now I'm getting bombarded with messages from high school friends calling me a creep and a jerk. I don't understand how people can side with her when she was the one mistreating me, and it's her responsibility to let her fiancé know about this. I was doing what I felt was right. I thought maybe they're reacting to this because they don't have the full story and the background about our relationship. So I wanted to post here. Am I the jerk or am I helping this poor man? Edit. Reading through your comments is making me question myself. First of all, I don't have a problem with how she looks. I think she's cute. It may be true that I am hung up on her. <laughs> Gee, you think? She was my first and my only long-term girlfriend. I do think I deserved more from her than an apology, and I did always think we would end up together when she worked on herself. I feel very frustrated about how things turned out. I'm against therapy, so I won't do that. I might contact her again to see if she'll talk to me. Maybe that will bring more closure. Even though it was mostly negative, I still appreciate the comments. So, you corner someone you dated years ago. She listens to you before stopping the conversation because it's going nowhere. Then you harass her fiancé and try to blow up her life? Jealous and bitter much? You're the jerk, big time. You're the jerk. Get over it. You just proved to the world that you're fixated on her. Is it possible she's changed since high school? Is it none of your business? You knew her then, her fiancé knows her now, and you know nothing about either of them anymore. Get your nose out of her business. You're the jerk. OP. I agree she may have changed. I did keep track of her through common friends and was following where she was in life. I didn't know she was engaged. This came as a big shock to me. I feel that I know her better than her fiancé since I knew her since we were eight and even though we didn't speak since high school, I did get updates on her via mutual friends. I thought maybe if we tried again together as adults, we could have a better relationship this time, and if she apologized for mistreating me and promised she would be better this time around, I was willing to give her another chance. But I don't see any evidence about her having changed, so I wasn't sure. Update. Just got done speaking to her. After the initial surge of comments here, I decided to contact her. I got her info from a friend and messaged her, and she agreed to talk to me. I apologized for contacting her fiancé, and she said she accepts my apology. She said she's sorry about the things that happened in our relationship. She said she had therapy, and now she has more confidence. She told me that she has been honest with her fiancé about her life and past, and he's really supportive of her. Overall, she sounded in a better place, and it sounds like I don't really have a chance with her at the moment. We ended the conversation pretty amicably. I feel okay with where things are now. Reading these comments was hard on me, but I don't have much control over how people interpret things, so thanks, I guess, for the comments. My sister, my boyfriend, and my parents have completely stopped engaging with me. 
I, 27 female, have a younger sister, Jenny, who's 25. Jenny has been with and married to her husband, Jake, who's 27, for almost three years, together for five. They really do seem like a match made in heaven. However, one thing she struggled with for a long time is infertility. Jenny has wanted kids for as long as I can remember. But when they started trying three years ago, it just never happened. They tried everything, but their doctor just said Jenny wasn't capable of carrying a baby to term. They've since looked into adoption or even surrogacy, though it is way above their budget. I, on the other hand, have never wanted kids. Not when I was a kid, not now, and hopefully I'll never have any in the future. I don't know why, but kids make me anxious, and childbirth is just a nightmare to even think about. Recently, I found out I was pregnant. It was a complete shock and sent me into a panic attack. My boyfriend, who's 29, was upset when I immediately suggested ending the pregnancy. I told him I didn't want kids ever, but he was adamant on not ending the pregnancy. He suggested taking full custody and raising the baby all by himself if that's what I wanted. He reluctantly even suggested adopting the baby out of my hands completely. Anything, but he was not willing to be without the baby. My parents reacted worse. They said they wouldn't allow me to hurt a living being and offered other options. They even told my sister, who just jumped at the chance to adopt my baby, saying it was perfect and the baby could remain in the family and be raised by loving parents. Now, I don't doubt they'd make great parents, but I just don't want to go through a pregnancy. Every moment felt like an explosion would go off at any moment. I hated it and I refused to continue with the pregnancy. I went behind their backs and got the procedure done. When they found out, my boyfriend just coldly told me that we're done and he walked out. He isn't taking my calls now. Jenny wailed and insulted me before Jake took her home. She then blocked me and has since refused to even look at me. My parents keep saying they're just disappointed in me and wished I wasn't their daughter so they wouldn't have to deal with me. I just want to fix things with them. They're my family and have always been kind and caring. I desperately want to sort their problems out and for things to go back to how it was before I got pregnant. Any advice on how I can explain my feelings to my family? Edit. Oh, please. My parents and my sister and boyfriend are not bad people. I know I wasn't in the wrong for making my choice, and neither do I think they're wrong for how they feel about it. My parents have cared for, raised, and supported me all my life. Through my teenage years, my studies, my relationship issues, career problems, everything. I know they aren't bad people. I just want to know how I can explain my feelings to them because I'm confused and struggling with expressing myself. My boyfriend and I have been together for nine years. We literally grew up together and promised to always be there for each other and always choose each other. He supported me through everything. He offered every help he could think of during the two and a half months I was pregnant. He tried to understand my fears and help me through it. I understand I was wrong to go behind his back, but that's done, and now I want to know how we can move past this. He didn't leave when people made fun of him for dating me, when college life got too hectic and we had to go days without seeing each other, when my grandma passed, when I was sick or when I was terrified of a baby. He was there for all of it and I don't want to be without him. Please help me convince him to seek counseling or therapy or whatever it takes. I can't bear to lose him. The ship with your boyfriend has sailed. I don't think you two will ever be able to recover from this. The reality is, your pregnancy made him realize how much he wants to be a father. You don't want to be a mother. Therefore, you two are no longer compatible. Your family may or may not come back around in time, but there will be no coming back from this breakup. Nine years or 20 years, you're fundamentally incompatible and that's not reconcilable. No one is wrong in this situation, except the parents and sister who had no right to involve themselves in the first place. You made the choice you felt was right for you, not going through with the pregnancy. He made the choice not to continue the relationship based on your choice, which he felt was right for him. Regardless of what you ended up doing, you were already standing on two opposite cliffs with your boyfriend, and there was never going to be a solid bridge between you. I'm sorry for your loss, all of it, but it wasn't going to work out once you both expressed wholly opposite views on childbearing. Am I the jerk for telling my boyfriend's kid I don't intend on being her mom? Context. I, 34, female have been in a casual long-distance relationship for two years with Matt, who's 40. I set boundaries at the start of our relationship. We will never live together. He will not be involved with my kids or my family. I won't be involved in his. My kids have a dad that's very active in their lives and we co-parent amazingly. The relationship I have with Matt is just that, with him. Matt agreed to these terms. Everything was great. 
We never argue because we have nothing to argue about. We have our separate lives, and when we're together, it's like a break from the real world. Matt is relocating closer to me because he's grown tired of the city and wants to live in a more rural place like I currently live in. He will still be roughly over an hour away, so it's within comfort. His daughter, Ava, is 12, and he was unable to leave her home as his mom had a slip and fall and wasn't comfortable watching Ava while she was on heavy medication. She just wants to rest. He wasn't comfortable leaving her at the hotel alone, so he asked me to watch her. I agreed, and we both understood it's a one-time thing. He tells Ava I'm an old friend, but I'm guessing she's heard my name before. It's not a traditional American name, because of what follows. She was being mean to my daughter, Rose, who's 11, making fun of her blemishes. I asked Ava if she wanted to go to the basement to play any of the games down there. She said no, so I told Rose to go to the basement, so she did. I then catch Ava slowly opening the basement door, and I ask her to go to the living room. She refuses and opens the basement door all the way. I tell her she's not allowed down there right now, but she's welcome to the Wii in the living room, or she can pick a movie to stream. We go back and forth, then I walk to the basement door and shut it. She starts screaming at me that I'm not her mom, so don't try to act like it. That's when I told her, Baby, it never crossed my mind because I have my own kids to parent. I have no intention of trying to be anything to you. I'm just helping your dad. She went to the living room and occupied herself with her phone. I made lunch, served it, she didn't touch it. Cheese quesadillas. Her dad picked her up later, and when he got back to the hotel, he called me about what I said. He said he understands why I said what I did, and it's true, but it was out of pocket to say it to her. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your boyfriend should have told her the lay of the land beforehand. I don't think it would be a good idea to do this again. Puberty plus a new partner of a parent is a bomb waiting to go off, and you're justified in not wanting to deal with that. OP. I agree. At this point, I'm sure she's put it together that when she has her weekend at grandma's, he's not sitting at home, so this will only get worse. Not the jerk. I thought that what you said was perfect. She was blaming her disobedience on you not being her mom, and you were like, I don't want to be your mom, but I still get to set the rules in my own house. Good on you. You're the jerk, but not for this specific question. Your casual boyfriend is moving closer to you, you blurred your boundaries by watching his kid. You and him are clearly in different headspaces when it comes to the relationship. Time to have a serious talk. I agree. Their relationship reads very much as friends with benefits and not a boyfriend-girlfriend thing. While I do admit that the friend's daughter was disrespectful, I think OP was too harsh with her response of, I have my own kids. To me, this reads, you're not my kid and you never will be. It just feels mean to me. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for what she said or not? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for suggesting calling off the wedding because she thinks the prenup is unfair? My girlfriend, who's 26, and I, male 24, just found out that she's pregnant. She's adamant about not wanting to have a kid out of wedlock, so we've been discussing getting married. We've been together for three and a half years. Prior to finding out about the baby, we had only talked about marriage a bit. I know she wants to get married badly, but I'm kind of on the other side of the fence. I'm not 100% against it, but definitely not eager or desperate to get married for multiple reasons. For one, my brother just recently got taken to the cleaners by his ex-wife. He pays her like $10,000 a month in addition to losing some of his properties. And that whole situation terrifies me, and I've never really seen what a marriage provides that makes the risk worth it. To me, it's just the same as being together how we currently are, but giving the state permission to be in our relationship. However, now that she's pregnant, I've been more open to it, just because I know how much it means to her. So we've started this process, and I'm slowly realizing that I may have bitten off more than I can chew. While me and my girlfriend love each other very much and are compatible in pretty much every way, our ideas about marriage, the wedding, etc. seem to be a little different. For starters, for the wedding, I was thinking we each pick some of our closest people, maybe 10 or so each, and we get married on an island or a beach, stay for a week or two, something cool like that so we can have fun and enjoy it. She pretty much wants the exact opposite. Massive wedding in a big venue. Now I don't see anything wrong with that type of wedding. It just seems like such a colossal waste of resources to invite every person we know when we could instead have fun for a week or two then get married on the beach with our closest friends and family. It doesn't necessarily have to be the beach. I'm flexible. But I think you get the idea I'm going for versus the idea she's going for. They're two completely different schools of thought. 
she basically wants to invite every single person she knows. Like I've looked at her list and she's got friends she hasn't seen in years, third cousins, literally everyone. To me, if I'm gonna spend a boatload of money, we should do it for ourselves, not people we barely know. We've been talking about compromises and making slow progress on that end, but we were getting there. She knew prior to getting married, I would require a prenup. I make about four times her salary and I own property and plan to acquire more. I had my lawyer draft up a prenup and she has her lawyer reviewing it. This is where we came to an impasse. Her lawyer believed the prenup was unfair and we've been going back and forth making changes. I've made some concessions, but I'm kind of at a point where I don't want to make any more. While I admit the prenup is definitely ironclad, I think it's fair considering the situation. I'm taking all the risk. Why would I continue to concede on things me and my lawyer both believe are fair? So recently we got into a minor argument over wedding stuff in general regarding the prenup and wedding and I was just like, maybe we should just keep things how they are. Of course, she flipped. We've cooled down since and she says she still wants to make this happen but that I need to be more open to compromise. I feel like given this situation, I've compromised more than I already should have. I talked to my brother about it and he told me I've compromised more than enough and to hold firm and worst case, you stay girlfriend boyfriend which is realistically probably better anyways. My sister disagrees and says I'm being a jerk for not working with her more. The way I see it, why would I risk everything I've worked for when I'm not even getting the wedding I want nor the financial protection I want just so I can say I'm married? There's just very few tangible benefits I'd be getting in relation to the risk. So am I the jerk? Update. We ended up having a discussion about the whole marriage thing where we both were able to get our opinions and concerns out there. Just me and her, no lawyers, no anything. It was really helpful because it let both of us get our concerns out there. We ended up agreeing that the whole marriage and prenup situation was too stressful right now while we were dealing with so many things, pregnancy, moving in, etc. So we agreed that for now, we would focus on the baby and pin the marriage conversation for now. I agreed I would be open to discussing it again in a couple of years once everything is settled down and she ended up being satisfied with that. That was last week and as of a couple days ago, we finished moving the rest of her stuff to my place. Her lease ends at the end of this month and all that is left in the apartment is some furniture she plans to give to her family. And since this is my last post about the situation, I'll provide some clarity about why I didn't want to compromise any further on the prenup. The language that my lawyer and I chose to use was very definitive about what would happen in the event of a divorce. On the other hand, hers was not. Again, still not going into details, but I'll say what my lawyer told me. He basically said that if I were to concede the language any further, he could no longer give me a guarantee on what I stand to lose. He said at that point, I would pretty much be at the mercy of the judge's interpretation, meaning anything could happen, especially considering the fact that we live in California. For me, that would defeat the entire purpose of the prenup, which is why I wasn't willing to concede on it. I actually was willing to concede on the actual wedding plans, but I just couldn't imagine letting a court system that is historically pretty unfair have the final say over my assets. I assured my girlfriend that in the event that we separated, I would make sure she was still taken care of, which made her feel better about the whole situation as well. I don't think my problem was necessarily the commitment to her, it was more the fact that someone else would have the final say over everything in the scenario where things go wrong versus myself having the final say, which as many of you have pointed out, means I'm just not ready for marriage. Reddit is so Reddit sometimes. Dude wants to protect his family wealth going into a marriage and he's being crucified for it? Never change Reddit, never change. I get a lot of people here do not have the experience of having generational wealth, but let me put it this way. Imagine you own some nice assets, like a couple of houses or something along those lines. Nothing outrageous, but decent. Now you have two choices here. Get some sort of agreement in place before marriage to ensure that these assets are protected and the benefits from them can be passed down to your kids, or two, let the government handle it and then have it sold during a divorce with half the proceeds going to your wife who can now spend it however she pleases, including on her new boyfriends or kids with other men or for plastic surgery or whatever else she wants. I have a family trust with some assets in it, shares and property that my wife has no part of and will never have any part of. The beneficiaries were initially just me, but since they've been born, my kids have been added to it. My wife will never ever be added to it. That money is for me and my kids. There is nothing wrong about wanting to protect your assets so that they benefit you or your kids. Wow, cool that you don't see your wife as family. Does she realize you see her this way? 
pretty crazy that this woman is just a vessel to give you kids, but is not actually family herself. This line of thinking is exactly why people keep making horrible mistakes, like the one my grandfather did. He died without any sort of asset protection in place, and instead of his kids getting his estate, his surviving second wife looted everything and gave it to her adult kids. I mean, you can try to shame people for not being idiots, but at the end of the day, idiots are people who don't plan for the eventualities of life. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his fiance? Please let us know. My boyfriend lied about quitting his job and put our housing in jeopardy. How do I get past this? I've been with my boyfriend for four years. After he got a job in an apartment building, we decided to move into an apartment there because he would get a big discount on rent. A year or so after living there, he started to hate his job due to the stress of having an understaffed team and long working hours. I suggested that he look for a new job if he was unhappy there, but he continued to stick it out because of how good the rental discount was. Well, one day, he comes home in the middle of the workday and says he's taking the rest of the day off. Two days go by and he still hasn't gone back to work. I ask him what's up and he says that he just needs to use up some extra days of paid time off. The weekend comes around and while out to dinner with friends, he gets a little drunk and basically reveals to me and two other friends at the table that he quit his job on the spot for good. On the way home, I ask him why he waited so long to tell me and why he would just quit cold turkey without a new job lined up especially considering that his contract states that once he stops working at the apartment, we have to be moved out within four weeks. Plus, at this point, he owed me a couple thousand dollars from shared expenses that he was catching up on. He said he was sick of working there and waited to tell me because he needed time to process it, but that he would figure out his work and our living situation. Fast forward a week later and we've applied for a new apartment. A few days later, we get denied due to rental history. I called the screening company to ask why, and they say that we have an outstanding balance at the current property we live at for last month's rent being late and now an open eviction filed because of it. I'm completely stunned because I send my portion of rent to my boyfriend every month and we pay on time. Turns out my boyfriend hadn't paid the rent and got served the eviction notice one day while I wasn't home, all before we had even applied to the new place, and he didn't tell me about any of it. I paid off the outstanding balance so that we could get the eviction filing dismissed. Luckily, I was only listed as an occupant and not as a leaseholder, so the eviction wasn't on my record too. But I'm livid because not only did he omit important info from me again, but now that meant he couldn't apply to a new place with me since most places will automatically deny you with an eviction filing on your record. So now we had fewer apartment options since we'd only be applying with just my income instead of both of our incomes. So a week before we needed to move out, I found a new place to apply to and with the help of my dad co-signing with me, I was able to get approved for it. I'm self-employed, so it's hard for me to get approved by myself, even though I make over three times the rent. It's been two months now, and my boyfriend still is unemployed. I'm covering all the expenses, and at this point, he owes me almost $7,000, since I've been covering his half of the rent, plus our other living expenses. He uses my car to deliver for Uber Eats, but it's just not enough, since he also has student loans and other bills to pay. I just don't feel like he's doing everything he can to find a job and pay me back. And the lies he told are making it hard for me to trust him. It feels like his decisions were so impulsive and he didn't even stop to consider how they would affect me. And whenever I try to address it with him, he gets really defensive and says I need to understand that he needed to do what was best for him and his mental health at the time. Would you be able to trust your partner again after something like this? Is this something worth breaking up over? How long would you wait for your partner to get their act together? Or what would they need to do to make things right? Why even get past it? Know that in a crisis, he will sink your shared ship without even giving you the courtesy of a heads up. Then he will lie about it for as long as he can manage to get away with it. In seven months, he will spend every dollar of yours without a concern. You're turning to your parents to bail you out because he wouldn't even grab a bucket to help keep you from sinking. Ask him to leave. Whatever he could conceivably do to make this right at this point, it needs to stop being done on your dime. You dump him before he permanently ruins your life. He's a mooch. His career plan is for you to pay all his bills while he lies to you. You would be foolish to trust him. He's proven himself unworthy of that. My ex came back and she's demanding I pay child support. Seven years ago, I was married to my dear ex. We were together for six years at this point. I thought we had a great relationship and I had received a nice inheritance. I used the money first to buy a condo for us to live in, 
a new car for her because hers was falling apart and as a thank you for her constant support over the years, and the rest went to starting my own company. I thought we loved each other. We had talked endless times about having kids. We both wanted a family. One day when I came home from work, she was seated in the couch and signaled for me to sit next to her. Then she told me that she was pregnant. I was shocked because we are both women. I started to cry for what this meant. Then she started to cry too and say, sorry, but that this could be a good thing now. I asked how on earth could this be a good thing and she said that this could be the perfect opportunity to us to have the family we always wanted. I didn't have the energy to argue at that point, so I went and packed some things and told her I was going to go stay with my cousin for a few days and come back to talk. I was a complete disaster with my cousin for a week. Then I returned, said I wanted a divorce, packed all of the rest of my things, while she told me that she can't do this without me, and that I'm abandoning our kid. I said nothing. I couldn't even speak. I didn't have it in me to do anything but pack and leave. In the divorce, I let her have the condo, her car, which was in my name, and she demanded alimony. I gave it to her for a year, even though she wasn't really entitled to it. She demanded child support too, but was denied for obvious reasons. A year later, it was done. A month before the divorce was finalized, I met a woman. I wasn't sure about dating, but my friends encouraged me to get back out there, so I did. It was slow. I told her about my past, and she felt really bad for me. We went on dates, we kissed, then she stopped responding to my texts and calls for a week. I didn't know what was happening. She then shows up at my home looking sad. She tells me she's pregnant, to which I think, not again, but she quickly explains that she found out a few days ago. She had an appointment that day and was told that she was about 16 weeks along, but she did not cheat since we had known each other for three months. That she knows this might be somehow triggering for me, that she really likes me, but understands if I want nothing to do with her, and left. Ultimately, I couldn't let her go, and we stayed together. The whole ordeal was a bit confusing at first, but we worked it out. Now my company is on the rise, and it's been for years. We bought a house, got married, had two more kids, a dog and a cat. Her family loves me, and my family loves her. But then, last Saturday, my ex showed up. We were in a family gathering on my wife's side when she showed up to my wife's aunt's house to expose me as a horrible person who abandoned her wife and kid and left them with nothing to go start a new family with a jerk and raise someone else's kid and that since I have money, I have to start paying the overdue child support, blah, blah, blah. Apparently, she befriended my wife's cousin's wife in PTA, told her about me, she gave my name and my wife's cousin's wife was shocked and appalled by my actions and decided they were going to confront me in the family gathering for everyone to hear and show them the evidence. My wife tried to argue back, but was cut off by her aunt, cousin's mom, and in a not very nice way kicked us out with a promise to take my treatment of my ex public and ruin my company. We left stunned, and my wife vowed she was going to start a war if anyone dared to slander me. On Sunday morning, we got a call from my wife's dad, her aunt's brother, to talk about what the texts and voicemails they were receiving were about. They didn't go to the gathering. We went over for lunch and explained everything that had happened. They knew I got divorced in the past, but I never told them why. They were understanding of the situation, but my mother-in-law still said that since I do have money, I should help out my ex, pay the child support, get her a place if she needs it, and be a parental figure in my ex's daughter's life. After all, the baby was conceived during your marriage. She has some odd spiritual beliefs. My wife is now mad at her mom for saying that. My wife's siblings are mostly on our side, except one who's close to cousin and believes his wife, and we've been ignoring the extended family. Update. First, I want to clear some things. I saw a lot of people get fixated on the fact that I gave the condo to my ex. I get it, but in the moment, I was just so low. I still had some love for her too, I guess, and I wanted to get rid of everything. So I thought, well, she will need a place for her and her kid, and it will be faster to just give it up to her. So I did, even against my lawyer's advice. My wife did not cheat on me. She hooked up with someone weeks before we even met. Then we met. A month after that, we went on our first date. Two months into our relationship, she finds out she was pregnant. We talked and moved forward, but slowly. We didn't move in together the next day. We just stayed together to see how things would go. It could have ended at any time, but it didn't. And we moved in together when her kid was about one year old. Mother-in-law has some weird spiritual thing with some of her friends going on since forever. It never bothered me really, but I do think some of her views are questionable. Update 2. It's been a few weeks. X hasn't showed up at my door again since last time. Thank the universe. 
She did, however, show up at my office looking for me last Monday, but I wasn't there, as I'm now working mostly from home to help my wife, who's on bed rest for the foreseeable future due to complications with her next pregnancy. I did go to the office on Thursday, and as I was leaving to go home, my ex's sister was waiting for me. We were close back then, but cut contact when the whole cheating thing happened, and my therapist basically advised me to. Anyway, she said she's been coming for a few days and waiting outside, hoping to see me, and she needed to talk to me, and it was really important. So we went to a cafe nearby, and she told me what my ex has been up to since the divorce. She sold the condo about one and a half years after the divorce was finalized, and moved into a house that she's renting. She said X said it was a quick way to make money to buy all the stuff a kid would need growing up. As the time went on, her family saw stranger than normal behaviors in her. I'm not going to go into too much detail, otherwise we'd be here a long time, but essentially she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder about two years ago and was treated for a bit, but then she stopped. I talked to my lawyer and he said that makes some things tricky as she could defend not guilty by reason of insanity, but the fact that she's been refusing treatment for a while now would help my case. Sister said that she's sorry for how X is acting and she would help me with whatever I need with the case. She's still around her sister to try and mitigate her episodes for the sake of her niece. I asked why the authorities haven't gotten involved and she said her parents are butting in for that not to happen. I couldn't stay longer. I had to get home before my sister-in-law had to leave. So we exchanged numbers and we'll be in contact if we need it. I have the hearing for the permanent restraining order this week, so hopefully that goes well. Also, she told me that my ex let it slip that she's not even sure who the biological dad is because she was hooking up with four different people around the time that she conceived. When I learned this, I felt even more stupid that she wasn't just hooking up with one and I had no clue. My girlfriend lied to me about an emergency to test my commitment to her. My girlfriend, who's 29, Andrea, and I, 29 male, have been together for a few months now. Everything has gone smoothly until yesterday when she pulled off a ridiculous stunt. She called me late at night to say that she's seriously hurt and having panic attacks and that no one is with her right now as her parents are out, which was true, they weren't home. She said that she's also got some chest pain and she thinks she's in real danger and that she's in a really bad state and can hardly breathe. She was heaving while she spoke. She begged me to help her, said that she's already called 911 but that she also wanted to let me know and I was shocked. I took my car to rush towards her house and it was only after reaching that I found out that she was joking about it. She met me joyfully and said that she only wanted to see how committed I am during an emergency as that's an essential part of a relationship or something. I lost my temper and asked her what the heck her problem was. She said that she was just testing me and I got ticked off. I called her some not nice names and I told her that I did not deserve to be treated like this. She was crying and saying that she only wanted to check whether I'm a good fit and that I overreacted. I left the house immediately and haven't talked to her since. She's been texting me, but I just ignored her. Am I the jerk? Update. After talking to her about it, I've decided to give her a second chance. She's apologized a lot and promised to never do that again. I'll be more careful, of course, and I won't be trusting her blindly. But I have thought that I'd give her one chance, especially since she's shown herself to be regretful. Not the jerk. Run. She intentionally put you in a state of panic causing you to drive in that state of panic, which is a recipe for disaster. An accident waiting to happen. You need to focus on the fact that she never gave your feelings any thought at all. To dismiss your feelings, she would have had to consider them. She didn't even think about you at all. Your panic was what she was looking for. It made her happy. It made her laugh. That's how sociopaths feel. If you were hurt in an accident on your way to help her, it would have been a home run for her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. That was messed up what girlfriend did. There's no reason to do stupid things like that. But I think it's kind of a stretch to say that she would have been happy if he had been hurt on the way there. Am I the jerk for not cooking Thanksgiving dinner and spending the day at the beach instead? I, 27 female, have solely been responsible for cooking Thanksgiving dinner for 20 plus people for the last 8 years. I do all of the shopping, cooking and setting up. Months before Thanksgiving, I start looking at grocery prices and tweaking recipes to fit dietary restrictions. Caribbean family, vegans and pescatarians, meat eaters. I also make enough for the college-aged kids to have leftovers. I usually make three turkeys, two party pans of mac and cheese, and a party pan of mashed potatoes, stuffing, green bean casserole, collard greens, yams, all sorts of stuff from scratch. Plus, all the desserts, apple pie, sweet potato pie, cheesecake, homemade ice cream, and breads also from scratch. 
I start making stocks and doughs Tuesday night. I bake my bread for stuffing and make my cheesecake and pies Wednesday after work. Cook all day Thursday so we can sit down and start eating by 4 so my aunts who work the night shift as nurses can enjoy. Every year people invite unexpected guests and it becomes 30 plus. I would be okay if it were plus ones, but my mom invites her friends and their kids. My mom and aunt ask me to make additional turkeys and some sides for their units. I never feel appreciated for everything I do to make it special and accommodate everyone. This year, I'm separated from my husband, and I really don't feel like bending over backwards cooking for people who don't even leave me leftovers to make a sandwich the next day. This year, I've decided not to cook and just spend my day at the beach, the only bonus to living in Florida. I was asked how much the adults should sell me for Thanksgiving groceries at the beginning of the month, and I told them I'm not cooking. Today, I received a zell from my uncle, and when I returned it, he asked why. I reminded him and the family group chat that I wasn't cooking. Now they want me to cancel my plans and cook. Am I the jerk for not wanting to? Edit. This is my favorite holiday, but my separation has left me emotionally exhausted and without any passion to cook. Edit. I don't actually mind cooking for the family. I look forward to it. The unexpected guests a little. The thing bothering me this year is that I expected to spend the only holiday I look forward to with my husband. I wanted to share the dishes that I love and scheduled chaos with him. I'm upset because I don't have my husband. They may not understand it, but I took on this holiday because I enjoyed it. Update. I listened to you guys and I didn't cook. The weather wasn't the best, so I didn't end up at the beach, but I sat by the pool and did some work in journaling. I enjoyed margaritas by the pool and wine at dinner. I don't know how I was able to drink all day and get everything done by 4 p.m. Dinner was late. We didn't end up eating until 6 p.m., so the people who worked that night just took to-go plates and couldn't eat with us. My mom called a few times from the kitchen, asking how to turn on the oven, make a pre-made ham and turkey. My aunt asked for the recipes that I previously emailed and asked if I could come over and supervise. I ignored the calls and texts. I did end up carving two-thirds of the turkey and helped clean up and went back to bed. My mom's friend ended up bringing herself and six other people empty-handed. The creepy family friend did the usual show up empty-handed, eat, grab to-go plates, and leave. My cousins were bummed they didn't get leftovers for finals. They were also shocked to see that their favorites weren't made and it didn't taste the same. No one took leftovers home besides my mom's friends and they cleaned us out. I think they finally realized how much work goes into it because my aunt complained that she had to go to multiple stores even though she was making one third of the food. My mom ordered from the fresh market and that was too much. Thanksgiving day, my husband and I spoke and had a great conversation about moving forward with the separation what it's going to look like for us financially, and a rough timeline of when we should be legally divorced. Saturday morning, I get a call from my husband's local hospital saying that he was injured while running. He had a stress fracture that resulted in a complete break in multiple places and needs surgery. Since I'm legally still his wife and he has not updated his emergency contact, I flew up and I'm currently at his bedside hoping I can get his family out here to take over. He didn't expect to wake up with me being there, but he was happy and thinks we should try counseling. All in all, I'm emotionally drained, working from his bedside. I should be able to take him back to our house tomorrow and get him set with his family and friends to take over. It's been nice being in a cold city and seeing him after so long, but I'm sure this marriage is over. Am I the jerk for kicking out my friend and ending the party after she fed my dog a treat? I, 28 female, always knew that once I could live alone, I wanted to have a dog. When I moved, I had that opportunity in the form of a relative's pet that needed to be rehomed. She was already very old, 13, deaf, and generally needed a lot of attention. It's been a year and I love this dog. She truly changed my life. I'm absolutely an annoying dog mom. She's also very allergic to something that her vet and I are trying to figure out what it is. It manifests in dry, flaky skin that she will itch hard enough to bleed. We're trying a food allergy trial. This means she's on a very specific diet of a prescription dry food until a trial period of 8-9 to nine weeks is over. If she does get something off menu, we have to start the trial period over. Most of my friends know this because I always complain how expensive the food is. Cut to the party. I invited a few close friends of mine to my place for a holiday shindig. Living far away, work, etc. usually keeps us apart, so I was super excited. I ordered us McDonald's. We all agreed beforehand to split a big order because why not, and made a ton of jokes to my dog about how none of it is for you, young lady, in front of everyone. I'll admit, this was a thinly veiled reminder for everyone else too. 
the food comes and we're all having a good time. I step away to find my friend, who's 25, and she's dropping a piece of fish fillet from my dog to gobble up in the kitchen. I freak out and ask her what she's doing. Again, my dog is deaf, so she just kept pawing at my friend for another piece, which she gave her, saying, But she's so cute, a little piece of fish can't hurt her. I'll admit, I kind of lost it. We were six weeks into the trial, and now I would have to start all over, buying so much more expensive food. I'm sure I went off on her. I don't really remember. I saw red. I do remember telling everyone that I'm sorry, but I'm too angry to enjoy or host a party right now and asked everyone to leave. I told them to also feel free to take the remaining food and don't worry about paying me for their shares since I'm the reason the party is ending early. The next day I apologized to my friend for yelling. She seemed very hurt and isn't very open to continuing the conversation. She says she honestly forgot and didn't see the harm. To be fair, fish was on the list of things that I don't suspect she's allergic to and may have mentioned that to the group. My dog is also on other medications that stop any harmful reactions to off-list foods. At most, she'll get flaky skin, but not super itchy or upset stomach or anything. My friends overall seem pretty split. Half the group thinks I'm justified and aren't upset with me for ending the party. The other half thinks that I'm overreacting over a piece of fish. Not the jerk. You don't feed another person's dog without permission, ever. For the last two years of my dog's life, she was on an extremely strict diet. Anything outside of this diet gave her pain and diarrhea. On top of that, she was incontinent due to her conditions causing muscle waste. I do want to add that there are some grains and proteins that dogs often can't tolerate. Mine was very allergic to anything corn or poultry. Like even a whisper of those two ingredients would have serious effects on her. I'm so sorry you had to backtrack. Mine also did the food elimination diet via the vet, but it was a bit different than yours. Plus, I know their fish is breaded and fried, so it could have still affected your food trial. Am I the jerk for paying $21,000 to send my kid to private school behind my ex-wife's back? Our son is eight and has an incredible curiosity about the world. His first and second grade teachers gave nothing but glowing praise in regards to both his intellectual growth and his demeanor. However, his third grade year has not gone well. His teacher has sent us several emails stating that our son does not pay attention in class and he's cold towards his classmates. When his mother and I asked him how school is going, he tells us that he hates it. He said, All the teacher does is yell at the class to stop talking. Then the kids keep talking and we never do anything. I hate being there. I can see the light fading from his eyes every day and every Sunday night, mid-September, he cries that he doesn't want to go to school. My son lives with his mother and spends weekends with me. We all live in the same town and I would describe the relationship between his mother and I as cooperative, but bad feelings persist. I asked my son a few weeks ago if he wanted to change schools and he said absolutely. I asked his mother if she would have any issue with me sending him to a highly regarded private school about 17 miles from our town. She reacted in a way that was not expected. She said I was being ridiculous and that it would be an undue burden on her to take him to a different school. Fair. And it would be unfair to her other kids if only one of her kids got to go to a private school. I added that I would take him and drop him off every day and pay for it 100% and she still said no. I told her I don't want our son to waste his potential, nor do I want to fail him as a father. In essence, she responded that our son is just being a brat because he's bored. I registered him at this school and I paid the tuition. He starts in August. I told him what I had done and he was so excited. Naturally, upon hearing this news, his mother was angry. All she said was, Fine, you tell him he isn't going because you think he's a brat. Am I the jerk? Her other kids are not yours, right? OP, correct. Then not the jerk. She's not a good mom for how she's treating him. Half-siblings whose non-shared parents have different means get treated differently. That's just how life works. Besides, if your wife is currently with her other kid's father, then it's also not fair that your son has divorced parents while his siblings don't. Courts may not look favorably on you enrolling him without his mom's permission. I'm not sure, but I do think you might want to try for more custody. It really wouldn't surprise me if your son is starting to get treated as the black sheep in that household, especially as time goes on and the siblings get older. Am I the jerk for divorcing my wife after she changed her mind about having kids? I know how that sounds, but I just feel like I'm losing my mind. Before and after marriage, we've talked about and planned our future down to the very city we'd live in and kids were always a part of it. Well, around September, I brought up when she'd want to start trying for a kid 
and she got really cold and told me that she didn't want any. At first, I thought she may have gotten some health news, and when I told her that we could adopt if the idea of pregnancy wasn't for any more, she kind of snapped on me and said that she wasn't trying to have this conversation at the time. A few days after this, I sat her down and asked what made her change her mind, and she got really frustrated with me that I'd even ask and pretty much said she doesn't need to explain herself to me. Since those two conversations, it was so strange. She kept trying to just move on and act as if those conversations never happened. So I straight up told her that we have to actually talk about it because this is bizarre. She told me I'm not going to make her talk about anything. So the last couple of months have basically been her frustrated that I won't let this go. The kids thing is a big part of it, but if I just knew what was going on, I'd feel better. So I brought up divorce and she told me that I'm trying to strong arm her into giving birth. Not the jerk. Her refusing to even discuss it is the problem. You're not trying to strong arm anyone. You're trying to have a healthy conversation about something that you believe the two of you were on the same page about and she changed her mind. Just get the divorce and move on. She doesn't want kids and having kids with her would be a huge mistake. Not the jerk. At this point, divorce is the only solution. If she relents and agrees to have a baby, she'll resent you and the baby. Just make your plans and file for divorce and hope it goes smoothly. Karen neighbor tries to steal my package. Huge mistake. So I had been waiting for my package that cost $700, was waiting for it like a hawk. I got a notification that the package was about two stops away, so I started watching live stream of my security camera waiting for the guy to deliver it. Amazon guy came and put a small envelope inside my mailbox, and I saw him take my big box to the neighbor across the street, and I saw that he rang the doorbell. The neighbor came out, and they took it in. First, I thought, Okay, maybe it's not mine. So I checked my orders and it said, delivered, handed directly to resident. That's when I knew it was in fact my package. I decided to wait about 30 minutes to give the neighbor a chance to bring it back, to just drop it off at my doorstep. But when I saw that she was not returning my package, I got my coat on and went straight to their house, rang the doorbell and said, Hi, I'm your neighbor from across the street. I saw that Amazon dropped off my package to your house and it looks like they dropped off yours at mine. The woman immediately said, Oh, I was confused. I thought my husband had ordered it. It was obvious she had every intention to keep it. The package came in three boxes, a really big one, another one sealed inside of it, and then another box, the actual item, inside of that second box. To my surprise, she had already opened the boxes. I don't believe for one second that she was confused. The label had my name and address right next to the part where she had to pull off the tape to open the big box. So then, she just wanted to give me the box of the actual item, which thankfully was still sealed. I guess she didn't open that one because she could see what it was and was probably going to wait to see if anyone would claim it. And I said, no, I'm going to need the other two boxes as well in case I need to return it. I watched her struggling to put all the boxes back into the big box, and then she gave it to me. I gave her her small envelope that Amazon dropped off at my house, untampered and sealed, and said thank you, which I regret saying, because not one time did she say sorry or thank you. I bet she's done this before and just keeps packages that aren't hers, but the audacity to receive the package and open it. Had she lied and said she didn't receive it, I would have shown her the security footage, but I gave her no option to say that she didn't receive it. Honestly, if she had opened it by mistake, and then brought it back to me apologizing for opening the package because she assumed it was hers, I would have been grateful and said not to worry and thanked her for bringing it back. I gave her the chance and the time to bring it back, but she did not. Now I refer to that house as the House of Thieves. I'd also report the delivery driver that claimed it was delivered and handed directly to resident since it clearly wasn't. OP. Yeah, I already contacted Amazon. Do you have an HOA you can report your neighbor to? There's no telling how many other packages she's stolen like this. I can't believe the audacity of some people. Who in the right mind would just keep a package that obviously isn't for them? The driver himself really messed up too, and I hope you report him to Amazon. Every time I've reported a driver for being an idiot, I usually don't see them delivering anymore after that, so I'm thinking they get replaced once they get a complaint. I don't know where they find these people, to be honest. They deserve the jump scare they get from my fake rattlesnake that I leave by the front door. Oh, that is so not cool. Amazon drivers are the worst. 
Like, how hard is it to check the address before you drop off a package? I'd definitely report him to the higher-ups and be sure to follow up on it. I had a friend that delivered for Amazon, and he said that drivers typically suffer no consequences for their complaints unless you reach out to corporate directly, which will usually result in them getting fired. Call me crazy, but what if she just didn't check the label? Unless I'm expecting a package, I just assume whatever arrives is for my wife, so I leave it in the kitchen somewhere that she will see it. I think you've been reading too many of these Reddit stories, and you might be assuming your neighbors are out to get you. Reddit, the place where being the voice of reason gets you downvoted to heck. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his neighbor? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for printing out a map of the grocery store for my dad? I, 18 female, am the only daughter in a family of four boys, 15, 13, 10, and 8. Our dad is pretty much a single parent since he and our mom divorced when the boys were younger and mom lives out of the country with her husband. It's more or less become my job to be the mother 2.0, which is fine I guess. I'm doing college online so it's not like I wouldn't be home to do stuff anyway. One of my unofficial jobs is to help my dad grocery shop. I used to go with him to do it and I would make the list myself and I'd just grab whatever we needed. But now that I drive the boys around for their extracurriculars, and I'm busy with school or chores when I'm not helping them, I really don't have the time. I just started writing the list and giving it to my dad so he could go out and get what we needed. Every single time this man has gone to the grocery store by himself, he's either completely forgotten about the list, remembered the list, then lost it, remembered the list but ignored it, or somehow could not find more than half of the things on it. It's hard to cook an actual dinner when literally half of what he ends up bringing home is frozen meals and pasta sauce, but no pasta. I've brought it up to him, but dad keeps saying that if I would just make time to go with him, or if I went on my own, it would probably be easier to get what we needed. I said that we could switch jobs, so he takes the boys to their things and I get groceries, but he said he doesn't know their schedules and he wouldn't want to mess it up for them. He said he'd go grocery shopping today and asked me to go with him, but I was working on some stuff for my finals before I had to drive the 10-year-old and the 8-year-old to their practices, so I couldn't go. I started making the list like I usually do, but because I didn't want to end up with only half of what I had put on there, I went and printed the layout of the grocery store. I even went online and found out which aisle each product was supposed to be on, and I color-coded the stuff he needed to get. I left it for him on the table and then went to take the boys. While I was doing schoolwork during their practice, my dad called me asking why I felt the need to color-code a map for him like he was a toddler in need of specific instruction. I replied saying that I only thought the map might make it easier for him to find the things I put on the list since I also made sure that everything was in stock online. It's been hours since we've gotten back home and he's very clearly upset with me, but he did get the stuff on the list this time. I don't know. I think maybe I just made him feel like an idiot and that's why he's upset. Was the map thing a little too much? Not the jerk. Your dad is asking too much of you and he's avoiding his responsibility as the parent. He could and should learn their schedules. He just doesn't want to. You should have a serious talk with him about how he either steps up or he hires help. Can't justify paying me? No problem. Just before lockdown, I worked for a small telecom company that did contract work for a national cell carrier. We'll call them Crab Inc. and Big Wireless. I was hired on as a full-time employee for Crab Inc. along with every other technician and we were not contractors important later. I was good at my job. I've been in the field for over 20 years, so I knew my stuff and most problems were easy enough to troubleshoot and repair. But sometimes we needed a second tech to help out with bigger issues, which is understandable in our field. Crab Inc. was shady, unbeknownst to us at the bottom of the ladder, but we were about to find out. About four months in, new orders came down the chain that from henceforth, we were to do double trips on every ticket. This meant we had to drive out with no parts, assess a problem, then make a return trip with parts to fix it. Two trips equals double pay for the company. Even on simple things like pushing a reset button, two trips, no excuses. Then they began cutting our hours, tracking our every move, and redoing our timesheets after submitting it, with the excuse of, employees are stealing time and we're going to prove it. The latest rule was a good one. All employees must work at least two tickets each day in order to be considered for a full eight hours of pay and 40 hours per week. No ticket, no pay. 
With this, they began holding mandatory bi-weekly meetings to go over every minute of our trips, overlaying GPS data, timestamps, travel distance, etc. They docked pay for gas station stops, bathroom breaks, phone calls, everything. They even tried to not pay us for these very meetings because our trucks were off and couldn't prove we were working. Buddy, I'm not a contractor. I'm a full-time employee. Enter glorious malicious compliance. See, the thing is, I don't take too kindly to people stealing from my paycheck and gaslighting me about it. And apparently, the other employees felt the same way. Give me one solid night of prep work and I'll beat you at your own game. The next weekend, I held a meeting of my own with the techs and after some explanation, we all decided that the company was absolutely right. Two trips, two tickets, every minute accounted for and the GPS data to prove it. Monday morning, meeting rolls around and every tech drove to the nearest site to have our mandatory two-hour meeting. The trucks aren't at home and running the entire time. Our daily tickets come in and we drive directly to the site, idle for two hours while we check out the problem, then do our second trip to get the parts, as instructed, and spend two hours fixing it, drive time not included. A second daily ticket comes in and what's this? I can't seem to figure out the problem. I guess I'll have to call another tech who only had one ticket to help me. Glad he was free. Let's ponder this problem for two hours while wasting fuel. Now we need parts. Looks like we both have to go get them. Return trip complete. Another two hours to fix the problem. Let's see how we did. First ticket. Two hours assessment plus one hour travel time. GPS logged. Two hour return trip plus one hour travel time. GPS logged. Second ticket. Same thing, all logged. Hey boss, Crab Inc. owes every tech 64 hours of work this week. Let's check the math and GPS logs just to be sure. Oh, and for some reason, the fuel expenses went up. But at least we have the GPS data you need for our extremely accurate PowerPoint presentation. Update per request. Crab Inc. folded from embezzlement, misappropriation of lockdown funds, and sued by Big Wireless for two trips, no excuse, among other things. There were a few jail sentences handed out. Not sure if anyone got a piece of that pie. Am I the jerk for giving my future mother-in-law an ultimatum around paying for our wedding venue? I, Victoria, 32, female, am marrying Alex, 48, male, in 2024. We live on the East Coast, but are both from the Southern United States, and Alex's family is essentially royalty in their hometown. His parents have a very visible local business, sponsor kids' sports teams, tithe heavily in church, and have their own jingle in commercials. Alex's mother, Frida, decided right away that I'm a gold digger because I come from a tiny town that she refers to as a patch of dirt in the middle of nowhere, and my government salary, which is public record, is less than half of Alex's, though we're both government attorneys. She constantly goes between making digs about my bland wardrobe to making a big deal out of buying me things like coffee and implying that I should be grateful that she and his father Fred are so generous and can do things like host us over the holidays. At Thanksgiving, Alex and I said that we were close to finding a venue, but the one we were looking at had quoted us $25,000, which we didn't want to pay. Not because we didn't have the money, but because it was just out of our stated budget. Frida immediately said that of course Alex wouldn't want to pay that, since he'd be paying all by himself and made a show of telling us that she and Fred would pay for the wedding. At the same time, they said that they expected us to get a prenup because Alex needed to protect himself and his family in case anything happened. We were going to do one anyway, so we shrugged and agreed. Frida immediately began telling everyone in town that she and Fred were paying for the whole wedding, and people kept coming up to me with thinly disguised sympathy to say how nice it must be to have a dream wedding due to Frida's generosity. Alex and I engaged counsel and have been passing our prenup between ourselves and our lawyers. Frida pestered Alex about it so much that he finally told her the holdup is with my counsel because my assets are more complicated to deal with than his. Even though he's told her before that I'm not a gold digger and didn't need his money, it apparently didn't sink in until now. She looked up everything from my property records to salary scales at my old big law firm and apparently realized that I'm worth nearly as much as she and Fred are. When she confronted me, I told her that she could either pay for the venue and I would continue to publicly agree with everyone that she was being generous to her new daughter-in-law, or that she could back out. We had changed venues 
and then I'd explain to everyone that she thought I had too much money. She hates both of these options, since one involves losing money, she thought she could lord over me, and the other involves losing face, since she told everyone in town I don't have any money and I'm after Alex's. So she ran off to bed with a migraine. Alex thinks I'm being too harsh on her, but I'm not so sure. Not the jerk, but you have to seriously consider marrying into a family like this. What you need to find out is where Alex stands with his parents and what his values are versus theirs. Is he a mama's boy that lets his mom make all the decisions for him and he defers all decisions to her and his father? If he does, then you really need to think twice about marrying him. He needs to cut the apron strings and back you as his wife, future wife. You basically need to know that he will have your back and will stand up for you. And even to the point where he will limit contact with his parents if they manipulate and gaslight. What do you think is going to happen when you have kids? Is grandma deciding how to bring up your own kids? Does Alex have any siblings with kids? What's their relationship with his parents? Have you spent time with them to get an idea of how controlling everyone is? Or do the kids' parents decide how they want to parent their kids? Has Alex been married before or had a long-term relationship? Does he have any kids? He's not old, but he's not young either. Does he want any? Do you? The ultimatum you gave your mother-in-law is neither here nor there. It's a lot of money, but may not be a lot if you're rich. It's the marriage that's important. If mother-in-law wants to plan your wedding as though it was hers, perhaps having an earlier small wedding in a location that's important to you is something worth considering, even eloping. You don't want someone else taking over. Even if you win against your mother-in-law when it comes to wedding decisions, can you be so sure that she won't try and sabotage it? Or that she'll wear black and a dour demeanor when making everyone around her miserable on your wedding day? A woman in a supermarket tried to eject me from my wheelchair and take it from me. I was at a supermarket called Shaw's in the rural town that I live in. It's just like any other store, but with a club that's supposed to make things cheaper. I had to go there for my favorite energy drink and dog food. I used my power chair because I was still feeling pretty weak after having been sick and I already have joint problems. While I was getting a pack of monster energy drinks and putting it under my seat, this random lady came up and pushed me and said, I need that chair more than you do because I'm older. Luckily, I was strapped in, so nothing bad happened. Normally, I would have unstrapped to lift something heavy like the energy drinks. I told her to stop, and she took my chair, insisting that I should use one of the scooters they provide in the store. I was stunned and said, this is my wheelchair. Please leave me alone. She kept insisting that I couldn't use my own chair in the store and tried to take it from me. So I quickly moved away at full speed on my chair, leaving her behind on a slow store scooter. It was pretty ridiculous. I went to the service desk and explained what was going on. The woman was following me and making a loud fuss. It took her ages to reach the desk on that slow scooter. She was yelling about me not needing the chair and causing a scene. When the staff told her it wasn't store property and she couldn't take it from me, she suddenly asked about artichokes, acting like nothing had even happened. It was so bizarre. I made sure to avoid her for the rest of my time at the store because I didn't want any more trouble. Looking back, it was more funny than anything else. As for why she acted this way, I guess maybe she thought she wasn't allowed to buy what I had, and that's why she was so insistent. It's still a strange situation to think about. Some people ask how I fit a flat of monster on my chair. Well, my chair has a rack under the seat where I put things, and I also hang bags on the arms to carry stuff. I didn't call the police because I live in a small town, and it's hard to get them to do much when you live somewhere like this. My Karen coworker demands I make her lunch. I have a habit of making my own meals to take to work, simply because I love cooking and health-related issues. So I started a new job in a new company three months ago, and seeing me making my own lunch every day has gotten some attention, and with that, I was able to talk and mingle in a new environment. My colleagues tend to ask me things like recipes, how long did it take, and so on, just small questions. Everyone was okay, except for this one girl from the same department with me, which I will name her Sally, 27, a junior designer. From the first day she saw my lunch, Sally has thrown in a lot of comments like how envious she is that I could cook my own meals, etc. It was fine until after one week later, she started asking me questions like, So, when will you make me lunch? I was taken aback, but I thought she was joking and waved it off with a smile and a nod. After that, at least once a week, Sally would ask me the same question again, and sometimes she'd even say things like, You still owe me a lunch made by you or she'll whine about me not wanting to cook for her. I've kindly turned her down every time she brings up this issue. 
Last Monday, she offered to pay me if I make her lunch for $3. I told her no again, and she was visibly upset. She told me it's not that hard to make her lunch since I'm already cooking for myself every day, single, and I'm being unsociable and unfriendly by not making her food. Since then, she's been passive-aggressive towards me, as well as not willing to cooperate at work when I hand her new tasks. It's made me feel bad about it, and I have no idea how to go about this. Should I have just made her lunch just to keep the peace? This feels horrible, and I don't know how to deal with it. Edit. After reading all your comments, I think I'll try to talk to Sally about this, and if I can't get through to her, I'll have to talk to my supervisor about it. Not the jerk. Tell her you are under no obligation to cook for anyone. I also suggest registering a complaint with HR before she turns this into something else. OP. I've told her that before, but then she'll say things like, but your food looks so delicious. It's honestly driving me crazy, especially now that her attitude has flipped 180 degrees after I turned her down for three months. Am I the jerk for trying to open my room door at the doctor's office? I just had an embarrassing situation happen at my doctor's office just now, and I need to know am I the jerk? I had a doctor's appointment today at 10 a.m. and an urgent dentist appointment at 11.30. My dentist is located about 45 minutes from where my doctor is, relevant to the story. It's also important to note that if you are even 5 minutes late for your doctor's appointment at this office, they won't see you. You have to be on time. This is common for most clinics though. I showed up for my doctor's appointment at 9.50 a.m. I pay my copay, the medical assistant showed me to a room, took my weight, blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature. Let me know my doctor would be in shortly and close the door. My doctor is a good doctor and she's thorough and sometimes she goes over on her appointments. It's not uncommon for her to show up to the room 15 or 20 minutes late. It's not ideal, but I'm aware of it and try to plan accordingly. I waited 45 minutes for her to come in, but she never did. As I said above, I have a dentist appointment, so I decided to leave. I tried to open the door, but the doorknob is broken. It turns, but the latch doesn't move so I'm literally stuck in the room. I try the knob again and nothing. I tap on the door and no one comes. I jiggle the knob, nothing. I knock on the door and no one hears. So I try to get it to unlatch on my end by trying to push up on the knob and while at the same time trying to turn it quickly and trying to turn the knob while pulling the door towards me and also pushing it away from me. This made a lot of noise and somebody started yelling at me to stop from the other side of the door. They open the door and there are four of the staff looking at me like I'm unhinged. I apologized, said I had tried getting their attention by knocking but no one heard. All I got was, oh, we heard, we all heard, that was so unnecessary. Went to the front desk to ask for a refund for the copay since I wasn't seen and they're all still looking at me like I'm some crazy person. I don't know, it was very embarrassing. Yes, I was irritated that I waited for so long and no one came. I feel like that's a normal and natural reaction to a situation like this, and this is a known issue with that doorknob. I've been trapped in that room before, but only for a minute. It needs to be fixed or replaced. Seems like a safety issue to me on top of everything else. And not just that, it's triggering for me to be in a situation like this. But was I acting crazy or yelling or pounding on the door or trying to break it down? No. I don't know what I could have done differently. Wait a few more minutes? Try knocking louder? I'm embarrassed and angry now and I tried to talk to them when I was there, but I really had to get to my dentist appointment, and I feel like trying to go back and explain myself is just going to be weird and awkward. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Doorknob issue aside, they heard you trying to get out of the room and ignored you. What if you were having an emergency? Rude and dangerous behavior on their part. OP. Well, I don't know if they purposely ignored me. The space of me tapping on the door to when they finally opened it was maybe a minute and a half. So maybe they heard me and were just getting stuff together or something. It just kind of sounded like all of them were talking out in the hall though. I don't know. I can only guess. Not the jerk. This is entirely unacceptable for many reasons. First, anything beyond 10 minutes waiting needs to be addressed. Patient time is every bit as important as provider time. And while emergencies happen, the patient is entitled to be advised and to reschedule if necessary. They ought to give you a refund and apologize. Second, it's a fire hazard to have rooms that you can't get out of, whether because they are locked or because the doorknob is faulty. I would report that to the local fire marshal. Finally, and this assumes you're in the US, there's a regulatory agency where you can file complaints. It's sometimes called a facility services complaint or something similar. I'd file a complaint. It goes without saying that you will need to find a new primary care provider, but you are hopefully already going to do that. 
Not one of them showed up for my birthday, not a single soul. I'm absolutely broken. The only reason I don't post this on my main account is because I don't want them to know how much they hurt me. I'm writing this one day after my birthday. This day was supposed to be special. I hoped it would be the first good day after a long while. A few months ago, my girlfriend broke up with me. This hit me hard and had a bad influence on my job. Now I don't know if I can make it through the test period and I'm so stressed out and my birthday party was one of the few things I was looking forward to. My plan was to start my celebration at a local pizzeria and let the guests choose from several options I had planned for the evening. For this reason, I arrived a little earlier because I still had a few things to discuss with the owners of the pizzeria. Everything was decorated and ready. I sat there and waited. When no one was there, five minutes after the party started, I called my friends one by one. No one answered their phones. I figured they were just late and I would just have to be patient. I sat there for about an hour, kept calling my friends with no answer and kept an eye on the door, but no one showed up. Eventually, the waitress brought my pizza to the table, but I couldn't eat. I started to tear up and kept hoping that at least one of them would come through the door. At some point, I couldn't take it anymore, ran to the bathroom and started crying. After I had calmed down, I returned to the table and saw the waitress standing at the table. I sat down and just mumbled that I wanted to pay. She asked me if everything was okay. I tried to smile to give the impression that everything was okay, but of course she noticed that I wasn't feeling well. The pizzeria refunded my money, also for the pizza I had eaten. I ran home and tried to contact my parents in the meantime. My father didn't pick up the phone, but at least my mother did. I asked her if she wanted to come and see me and explain what had happened. She said she would like to, but didn't have the time. I spent yesterday evening just sitting at my computer and at least trying not to burst into tears, but it wasn't that easy because I saw some of my friends online playing a game. It wasn't even that they didn't have time, they just didn't want to spend it with me on my birthday, and they didn't even care enough about me to at least cancel so I wouldn't have had to wait for them. My mother offered to talk to me about it again today. She said she would call me, but she didn't, and when I tried to call her, she didn't answer. I guess I'm writing this because I'm desperate and just want someone to listen to me. The only people who were wishing me a happy birthday were my parents and the pizzeria staff. I mean, I was used to my brothers not remembering my birthday, but not my friends. That's a hard read, really upsetting. I can only imagine how it felt. Maybe this is a sign that they're not your real friends. Delete them completely from everything. Pick yourself up, start fresh, and go out and meet some people. You can do this. We all know you can. Sometimes we just need a shove to make the jump. OP, having been there myself, trust me when I say there's no point keeping these people around to let you feel consistently crappy about yourself. It only builds distrust and poor self-esteem when you finally decide to make new friends. OP should start making new friends after working through their grief because I can assure them most of us would have loved to celebrate OP at the pizza party. This is the harsh truth. Your family and friends don't love you. Here's the second truth. There's nothing you can do to make them love you because they are abnormal. If you think about this and grieve, it will be easier for you to move on. Stop calling them. Stop expecting an explanation. Am I the jerk for throwing my food in the garbage instead of giving it to my daughter? What I did was wrong. I feel stupid. I kind of snapped, I guess. My husband and I have two daughters, Haley, who's 12, my stepdaughter, and two-month-old Hannah. Since I gave birth, up until two weeks ago, I couldn't keep down any food outside of crackers. It would just make me sick, which the doctor said was because of me adjusting to naturally feeding and that it was normal. So up until two weeks ago, every single hot meal I made was eaten 100% by Haley and my husband, though I still made myself a portion just in case. Haley always ate my portion before leaving the table. She would see it set out on a plate for me that I would try picking at, but as soon as she touched it, I would stop picking at it and she would just take over. I spoke to her about it a few times because I won't eat anything that another person has touched. It grosses me out. So she knew. She just didn't care to stop because it's not like you're going to eat it anyways. My husband has spoken up to her several times and ultimately told me that I just wasn't making enough food because Haley was still starving after eating her plate and second helpings. When I was finally able to keep food down again, I started making more dinner to combat the issue. Like, I made a big sheet pan of lasagna. Definitely should have been leftovers. But my husband had two helpings and the rest went to Haley because right after I made dinner, the baby was fussy and tired and ultimately needed to be fed. So I excused myself to the other room and when I came back a half hour later, Haley was eating the last portion out of the pan using her fingers. 
so she touched it and I wouldn't eat it. Or last night, I made five medium-sized chicken breasts. My husband had two, Hallie had two, and I had one on my plate. I was eating it slowly so I wouldn't get sick. Haley ate her entire plate and then she said, You gonna eat that? And put her finger directly on my chicken. My husband sent her to her room, but ultimately I didn't eat it. She knew what she was doing. Then tonight, I made five cheeseburgers for them. I can't eat hamburger. And two hot dogs for myself. Again, I ended up having to feed the baby directly after finishing dinner. They had eaten by the time I was finished feeding the baby. I made myself up my two hot dogs and Haley reaches over and picks up the hot dog, bun and all, and flips it over, puts it back down and says, was just checking if the bread was moldy. And then looks up and sees me glaring at her and says, oops, sorry, forgot. Guess you're not going to eat that now, so I can have it if you want. I took my entire dinner, plate and all, and chucked it in the trash can and walked off. She starts crying to my husband about not meaning to upset me and that she was just hungry. <laughs> She's always hungry from the sounds of it. My husband yelled at me for being childish and wasting food and left with his daughter. He said, Yeah, I get that it's annoying and I reprimanded her every single time, but you didn't have to stoop to her level. You're more childish than she is. Edit. It's not just dinner that this happens with. Even when I was eating nothing but crackers, she would still ask me for my food. She eats multiple snacks during the day, as well as big breakfasts and lunch. She's been to a nutritionist and she's healthy. She has a high metabolism and just constantly wants food, as well as bored eats. Never gains a pound though. She's 5 foot 2, 86 pounds. She's not overweight. She barely gains anything. Not the jerk, but your husband and stepdaughter are. She sounds troubled in some way. At 12, she should understand what she's doing and be able to control it. So my mind is she's touching your food to provoke you. I believe you are right to throw your food away. I wouldn't have touched it after she put her grubby hand in it. Your husband needs to deal with this little jerk. Is she jealous of the new baby? Not the jerk. She's not going to change and your husband isn't doing good parenting. So you have to adapt and change. Stop sitting where she can do this to your food. Stop fixing her plate. Make her do it herself. Change up how dinner is served. Put hers somewhere else while the adults eat at the table. Change up your schedule. Eat when she's not there or eat at different times than when she does. Figure out what food she hates and fix them. If she starts to reach out towards your food, yell at her as loud as you can. No! And squirt her with a squirt gun. <laughs> Treat her like the little unmannered feral kid that she is. Just don't sit there and be a victim. Show this girl that you are in control. You're the adult and she's a kid. I've got a feeling we'll be reading one soon called, Am I the jerk for squirting my stepdaughter with a squirt gun when she kept touching my food? Am I the jerk for boycotting my sister's wedding since she accused my wife of fraud? I, 35 male, come from an intellectually pretentious family. I married into a very blue-collar family. Throughout my adult life, my older sister, who's 38, has always disapproved of my partners. I met my wife when she was in college and I was in the Navy. My sister immediately disliked the bubbly and unfiltered college girl and determined my wife was untrustworthy and dragging me down. Four years ago, my wife suffered a traumatic brain injury. It occurred right around the time we conceived our second baby, so we chalked off the dizziness, headaches, and other symptoms to her pregnancy. Nearly a year postpartum, the symptoms hadn't improved, and she started scheduling medical appointments to get checked out. At this point, she was in the Navy. I was separated and in grad school. Over the next 18 or so months, my wife endured an endless slog appointments, tests, exams, more consultations, until it was finally determined that my wife had a rare neurological condition that to be honest, I don't fully understand. She was medically retired and classified as a disabled vet. During this whole process, my sister's way of being supportive was to tell me it's probably nothing and not to worry about it. This past weekend, I was chatting with my sister. My wife had gotten a holiday job helping deliver packages but called out on Black Friday to stay at her parents longer. My sister made a comment about my wife suddenly being sick when she doesn't feel like working and claimed my wife had done the same thing to get medically retired from the Navy. As is the habit in my family, I replied with equally snarky jabs, reminding my sister, who's a nephrologist, that my wife injured her head and not her kidneys and she doesn't know what she's talking about. My sister claimed it took too long because my wife was doctor shopping for the diagnosis she wanted. I told her if I got paid what she did to sit in an office and say, keep doing dialysis, I wouldn't have personal days either. 
I had confronted my sister and my mother in the past about their accusations that my wife was milking the system and needed to suck it up. After some very heated exchanges, they had gotten better about keeping their thoughts to themselves, a feat with my family, but this one pulled no punches. My sister is getting married in September, and I told her unless she apologizes and admits she doesn't know anything about my wife's medical history, we won't be in attendance. Is boycotting my only sibling's wedding an overreaction? Am I the jerk for using choosing the wedding as the event not to attend when it is such an important day to her? Not the jerk, but why do you keep forcing your wife to be around these people? Your family isn't just pretentious, they're judgmental and unkind. Your wife doesn't deserve that. As someone with an invisible disability, I have so much sympathy for your wife. Getting approved for disability was a nightmare because I didn't have a common issue. I've seen specialists all over the US, they still don't fully understand what's happening. I genuinely wish that people who doubt situations like your wife's could spend a day in her or my shoes. If I suddenly felt well enough to sit in an office 8 to 10 hours a day, I'd not only surrender my disability, I'd pay it all back to focus on a career job, track important events, get up early and not be so fatigued that I literally fall asleep standing up. Your sister's career is a luxury your college-educated wife lost. Your sister is awful. Instead of skipping the wedding, I'd say, show your wife some support and go no contact with these people who don't care enough to understand her reality. But maybe I'm just too close to the issue. Your whole premise that your wife isn't a faker is a bit undermined by the fact that you admit your wife called out from work on the busiest day of the year just to extend her vacation. Those are hardly the actions of an honest person. I don't know anything about your wife, aside from what you're telling me. However, you hardly paint a flattering image of her work ethic. Karen ruins my professional cookware. The problem started when my girlfriend moved in about two years ago. I'm a former professional chef with a great passion for food. Over the years, I've gotten myself a lot of kitchen equipment that's quite expensive. If it breaks, I won't be able to replace it for at least a couple of months that I take care of as if it's my little babies. I have knives, pots and pans that I've kept in pristine condition despite using some of them a lot for 10 years or more. I also have a bunch of cheap, low quality equipment in my kitchen that I call my crap pans. When she moved in, she asked me about them and why I don't just throw them away, and I jokingly told her that I keep them in case I have people with me that I don't trust in my kitchen. Sometime after she moved in with me, I started noticing scratches in my non-stick pans, dents in my knife edges, and deformations in my pots. I started observing my girlfriend when she was cooking and saw her cutting stuff with one of my Japanese chef knives directly on top of the stainless steel counter, and I told her right away to use a cutting board. I've seen that when she's done with a pan, she puts it under running water to cool it down. She uses dishwashing soap in my cast iron pans and the list goes on. I've told her multiple times how to take care of the equipment and what and what not to do, and pretty much every time I correct her, she gets annoyed. So last week I came home and to my horror, I saw my 5 liter cast iron pot filled up with water that had dishwasher soap in it. It's one of my favorite pots that I've seasoned over the course of 15 years. I snapped and told my girlfriend that she's not allowed to use my expensive equipment anymore and showed her the crap pans and I told her that those are the ones she's going to have to use in the future. She thought I overreacted, but I refused to budge. I'm getting tired of resharpening knives every other day and having to throw out pans that I've inherited from generations back because they got deformed or rusted beyond restoration. She reminded me of how I said the crap pans were for people that I don't trust and questioned whether I trust her or not which I do, just not with my kitchen equipment. So please enlighten me. Am I the jerk for banning my girlfriend from using my kitchen equipment? I'm going to say not the jerk. I'm the same as you. I am a one-woman army in the kitchen, and I have some expensive knives and equipment that I've been gifted over the years. I learned how to take good care of them all. I do 99% of the cooking in my house, and my husband used to also accidentally mess up my stuff when he did. I told him to either do the right things to clean them or to just leave it if he forgets how to use it and I'll take care of it. You explained how to properly clean and care for your stuff and she isn't doing it. And on top of that, she's getting visibly annoyed when you remind her. She doesn't care about the stuff that you clearly do. Plus, it's not like you gave her no alternative. There are pots and pans and knives that she can still use. I think it's fine to have stuff that's just your own for whatever reasons you want to have them. In this case, she's not respecting your stuff, so you get to have your own, and she has hers. Well, what do you think? 
Should OP let his girlfriend use his cookware or not? Please let us know. If Reddit boy scratched my Teflon, he'd need a new head. Am I the jerk for making my boyfriend do all of the chores? I, 30 female, run a small online business from home. November and December are my busiest times of the year when I make a lot of money that allows me to work less during the year. I've been doing this since I was 25, so I've got a decent idea of what I can and cannot do, and focusing on work only for one to two months is a sacrifice I'm willing to make for their chill rest of the year. This year, I've moved in with my boyfriend, male 35. Well, technically, he moved in with me because I own the house, so it was a no-brainer for him to move in with me. We split chores half and half. He works full-time, 37.5 hours a week. When he moved in, I had a talk with him, letting him know that I can't do any chores in November or December, and asked if he could pick up the slack because I'm physically unable to do any chores, as I can be working anywhere between 12 to 18 hours a day. I take a full January off to decompress. He said he doubted I worked that much, but we would see. I asked again in September and October to make sure that he was aware that I won't be doing anything. I meal prepped in advance, and I felt he kind of dismissed me. Mid-November, we had an argument about my chores not being done, and I reminded him of what I told him. He said that he thought I wasn't being serious and told me there's no way he'd do 100% of the chores because he's working too. I said, fine, don't do my chores. They can wait until I have time. That's how I was when I lived alone. No problem. I don't make much mess anyway. He wasn't happy, but dropped it. We haven't seen each other much because I've been working so much, but he's been more and more upset and blew up at me today regarding the chores. He said I had to have a better work-life balance and to grow up because the house was a mess. I told him if it was a mess, it was his fault because I barely leave my office. He called me a lazy jerk. I told him I didn't have time for arguing and I went back to working. He stood in front of my locked office door shouting how he couldn't believe I was being serious about not doing chores and it was a jerk move to leave it all up to him. He thinks I'm a major jerk for basically disappearing for two months and following through with not doing chores. Am I really the jerk for saying I won't do chores and following through with it? Not the jerk. Someone who called me a lazy jerk in my house wouldn't be living in it much longer. He called you a lazy jerk? That kind of disrespect and rudeness in a relationship would not fly with me and he'd be out. Not the jerk. Wow, your boyfriend is showing his true colors. Believe him. I know that right now you don't have time to rearrange your life, but once January comes around, you should give yourself the gift of losing the deadbeat boyfriend. For what it's worth, I'm married, and both me and my husband have gone through times where we had to pick up the slack for each other for whatever reason. And it's not always a work reason. There could be health issues, the birth of a child, travel, and a billion other things that come up. Your boyfriend is showing you that he will throw a fit and call you names whenever he needs to support you. This is bad, really bad. It should be a deal breaker. Everyone sucks here. You're a grown woman and can clean after yourself. Many people work crazy hours, and not just during two months of the year, but they keep their shared living spaces clean. Your boyfriend escalated it by calling you names, and he could have helped out more, especially knowing that you're stressed. I think you need to both sit down and have a conversation, or you may not be happy in a relationship in a month. The answers on here are funny. If the situation were switched and a man said this to his wife, everyone would be saying he is a jerk because she works too and chores should be shared. It should be the same in this other direction as well. She can take an hour or two and do chores. I work for an accounting firm and quite frequently work 14 to 16 hour days, not including commute, and I still keep up my end of the chores. Instead of sleeping in on Saturday or Sunday, I get up and catch up on chores. She can do the same. We get it. A woman hurt you. But no, she communicated perfectly, multiple times, set herself up for success. A 35-year-old freeloader who pays no bills and doesn't want to contribute at all is the jerk. Um, I am a woman. As I said, he's not taking advantage of her. He's complying with their agreement. She can still do her part. She might not do it every day, but she can give up an hour or two of sleep on the weekends to get it done. It's not rocket science. You know full well if a man would have made this post, people would be all over him saying, oh, you expect her to do everything and clean up after you, blah, blah, blah. But when it is a woman posting that she is working a lot and can't do chores, then it's all good and fine. Talk about a double standard. Well, who do you think is the jerk? 
OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. I love it when the minions on Reddit get into quarrels with one another. Six dirty dishes made me quit this place. Perhaps relevant. I opened this location as the assistant manager, took a long maternity leave, then returned as a shift lead. The GM is the same one I was assistant to. In August, the morning cook quit and we still haven't replaced him. I've been doing twice the work since then. The start of my shift is stressful because I set up the entire cook line alone. In 90 minutes, I do all this. Turn on all the equipment, turn on six of the eight fryers, clean the filter machine, filter the other two fryers and turn them on. Top of the fryers with fresh oil, stock up two stations with about 150 pounds of meat on each, set up ice bath and batter for both stations, make and hot hold our buffalo sauce, temp all the fryers, start two new time control logs, set up sanitation water and hot soapy water, and have all of the fried chicken ready before we open. So drop about 20 minutes before open. Yesterday morning, I was five minutes late due to the snow. There were multiple containers of chicken that were half full or less, so I had to spend time consolidating them. There was also not a drop of batter in the house, so I had to make a whole batch, which takes at least five minutes. Finally, all our livers were spoiled, so I had to take those out to the dumpster and take them off the POS. Basically, about 15 minutes of not setting up the line. As I'm scrambling to finish the batter I made, the kitchen aide, Marta, tells me I need to do my dishes. I had dropped off a couple chicken containers, the pan that had the spoiled livers, a bowl, and two whisks. She was training one of the line cooks in kitchen aid duties, so there was an extra person. This means she had less to do and was doing dishes immediately when they came to the dish pit. As I'm rushing to open the line alone, I saw her just stand around watching the trainee. I clarified three times that she was talking about me. I was so taken aback for multiple reasons. One, she saw me hustling to do all this crap and I was running behind. Two, I always contribute to the dishes. I even stay late sometimes to do all the dishes and clean the dish pit and put in fresh water before the evening kitchen aid comes. Three, I'm a shift lead and she's supposedly my subordinate. I simply said, I'm too busy right now, to which she said, no, it doesn't matter. I told her I would do them later then and walked away to continue setting up the line. It's 25 minutes before open at this point and I'm only halfway set up. When I come back to get the second batter container, she stops me again. She tells me that dishes are all our responsibility and we have to collaborate as a team. Okay then, leave them aside and I'll do them later. She immediately says no. I have no problem doing the dishes. I actually genuinely enjoy it. It's soothing to take something dirty and make it clean. The water is warm and the soap smells nice. I just can't wash dishes and also set up the entire cook line while out on time crunch. The general manager, Bill, arrived a couple minutes after the altercation. Immediately discredited my thoughts and feelings on this. He kept repeating that it wasn't a big deal and that she didn't realize I was so busy. When I said that's not the point, her saying no and lecturing me about how to do my job is called insubordination. Bill actually rolled his eyes and said it's not that serious and to calm down. Marta did not need to apologize to me. She was passive aggressive the rest of the shift. She put me in danger by not calling out basic kitchen safety things like behind you with hot or oven opening behind you. She opened the oven door and it actually grazed my leg and she didn't say anything. Marta then argued with Bill about cutting the potatoes. He said she was cutting them too small. There was a back and forth, then later I checked and the potatoes were cut the way Marta likes them. She runs this store now apparently. I had to work the rest of the shift feeling like crap. Bill even told me I should apologize to Marta so things aren't awkward. I retorted that she should be written up for insubordination. Bill rolled his eyes again. At the end of my shift, I put in my resignation. I told him that he expects me to do all the manager duties but I don't get the same respect. I let him know that he discredited everything I said and solidly defended Marta. I even let him know that I don't have a job lined up, but I just couldn't take the disrespect. I'm sad. I loved that job. I could see myself there another 10 or 20 years. But the way Bill handled that situation was the glass shattering moment. I am not valued. I am not respected. I work so hard and I have a supportive management style. I'm always helping wherever the work is needed. Being lectured on dishes is just straight up offensive to me and Bill did nothing to support me. Edit. Talk to the office manager of a dental office I used to work for and I start Monday. To those weirdos attacking me, 
Weird that you assume my income supports my kid and my womanly emotions have now caused us to be on the streets. My husband makes more than enough for me to not even work and it's my choice to work. I quit with nothing lined up because I knew I'd have a new job in days and that I don't even need a job at all. Why do you people spread hate and anger like that? This is just a vent that a lot of people here can relate to, nothing more. It's not that serious. Calm down. Am I the jerk for making a scene when my son refused to dance with me? This all started when my son, Ben, graduated high school. There was a formal dance. I was very excited for the mother-son dance. Every time I brought it up, Ben would say he wasn't going to dance. I didn't take him seriously. I thought he was just being shy. When we got to the formal, everything was beautiful. But when it came time for the formal dances, he was nowhere to be seen. I approached my older daughter, Alice, and my husband, who I could see were talking and laughing. I asked if they had seen Ben, and they laughed and said he was going to go hide so he didn't have to dance. I was absolutely heartbroken. My son was literally hiding from me. I stood in the corner during the mother-son dance, watching all his friends dance with their moms. I couldn't take it, so I told my husband and daughter that I was walking home. When they got home, Ben walked right past me and went to his room to get ready for the after party. My daughter hugged me and went to go get ready because she was driving Ben to the party. After our kids left, my husband and I had an argument about what had happened. He said he was appalled at my behavior and that I was acting like a kid. I said that the least Ben could have done was dance with his mother. He said that today was supposed to be about him and his accomplishment, not me. But in my opinion, today should have also been about celebrating the people who helped him get to where he is now. Things got quite heated and before going inside, my husband said that he wasn't going to force his son to do something he didn't want to do on his day. I was taken aback by this, so I just stayed on the porch, trying not to cry. I thought my husband would support me. Later, my daughter returns home and sees me crying. She gives me a hug and gave me a chocolate bar to try to cheer me up. If no one else, my daughter would be on my side. She danced with me at her graduation. She danced with her father. She understood how important this day was for me. I asked if she was on my side. She said something along the lines of, I know you're upset, but I don't know what you expected from him. It took a few days before we really spoke to each other again, and after a few weeks, everything went back to normal. Coming back to the present, my daughter recently got engaged. We were talking about it on a family FaceTime, and the topic of when Ben will get married came up. He said he was never going to get married because he doesn't want to deal with another round of dance drama. When I asked him to clarify, he said that he was obviously referring to his graduation. I was appalled at this attack. He won't get married because of me? I won't lie. I'm upset that he still does not want to dance with me, even at his own wedding. Now my husband is mad at me. My son refuses to answer my calls or texts. Am I the jerk for making a scene and starting an argument because my son never wants to dance with me? Edit. Okay, it appears as though the response is pretty unanimous and I have a lot of thinking to do. You're the jerk. When he said, I don't want to dance, that should have been the end of the story. It sounds like you walk over his boundaries often and that was one of the first times he's spoken up to you about it. You're going to be a very interesting mother-in-law. I don't understand why he couldn't have had just one dance with his mom for the son and mother dance while all of his other classmates did. Was he too cool to dance with his mom? I'm pretty sure every teenager feels that way. But the others somehow managed to make it through one dance with their moms Hopefully, he will be really embarrassed for humiliating you this way. I'm not going to lie. All these you're the jerk comments are a little harsh. I do agree with the son having the right to say no to the dance, but it is a little harsh. His mom was excited for this dance. I feel for her too. As someone with a husband that refuses to dance for anything, even weddings, I sympathize. I'm sorry that this experience hurt you, OP. I don't think you're the jerk, but nor is your son. It just sucks. No jerks here. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or her son? Please let us know. If Reddit boy wanted to dance with me, he'd need a new... I know, I know. I'd need a new head. Uh, I was just going to say you'd need a new pair of shoes. Those things have been falling apart for the last three years. Am I the jerk for telling my sister it's her own fault her family is a mess because she wanted to adopt? My sister, Lucy, who's 38, has always wanted to have a big family. She and her husband, Tom, who's 40, had their son, Logan, who's now 9, but due to complications, Lucy couldn't have any more kids. She was devastated. About three years ago, she and Tom decided to adopt. 
Tom never outright said that he didn't want to go through with it, but it was clear to see he didn't care one way or the other and just wanted Lucy to be happy. Logan said he didn't want to have a sibling. Lucy brushed over all these concerns with the they'll get on board eventually attitude. Long story short, they were eventually matched with a boy, Jack, who is now 11. Lucy said that they all bonded, but Jack had behavioral issues and whenever I saw them, I picked up on the fact that over time, Tom seemed to be getting less and less keen and many times when it was just adults, he commented on his worry that Jack had latent issues because of his traumatic past. Lucy adored Jack and rubbished those concerns. I brought up Tom's hesitation, but Lucy said it was just taking longer for him to bond. They officially adopted Jack about a year ago, and since then, things have fallen apart. Jack's behavior has either got a lot worse, or Lucy wasn't speaking about it as much before, but it's clear Tom is at his wit's end. According to Lucy, he works late consistently, and whenever Jack has a tantrum, he helps Lucy calm him down, and then takes Logan and leaves the house. Logan now hates Jack and won't play with him, which causes more issues, and he started to act out. He spent his last school holiday with my family and is set to spend Christmas with us again because even the family therapist says it's good for him to have some space. Having seen this all unfold has been heartbreaking. Tom and Logan look more miserable every time I see them, and though Lucy would never admit it, she is too. Whenever I speak to her, she talks about how hard it is, but always has Tom and Logan at fault. She's never taken any accountability for the fact that she didn't listen to anyone's concerns. She called me a couple of days ago to discuss plans for Christmas and when Tom would be dropping Logan off at my house. She started ranting again about how Tom has shut down at home with her and Jack and how she thinks he's going to leave. She was calling him every name in the book and then started saying she was disappointed that Logan doesn't love Jack and she can't believe she raised a bully. I lost it. I told her the real bully was her. She bullied her family into adoption as a form of wish fulfillment and Tom shouldn't have indulged her, but most of the blame falls on her for destroying her family. She screamed and cried and eventually called me evil and hung up. My parents are now saying that I was a jerk for telling her that, even though it's what we all think, but I think she needed to hear it and stop blaming her own kid for being unhappy living in the chaos that she created. Edit. For everyone saying that I said or implied that Tom is blameless, I didn't. I said to Lucy that Tom shares the blame, but I do think most of it lies with her. Who I don't think has any blame, no matter how she tried to place it on him, is Logan. Not the jerk, but what kind of parent adopts a kid older than their own biological kid? I'm surprised the adoption agency didn't pick up on that during the interview. OP. Honestly, there's a lot that I'm surprised they didn't pick up on during the interview. You're the jerk. Adoption is a long process. If Tom didn't want to go through with it, he had plenty of opportunities to speak up and say no. If he was too cowardly to openly say so, there are plenty of ways he could have quietly torpedoed the adoption. You have to meet a lot of criteria to be assessed suitable. He could have messed it up. Lucy didn't force him into this. If Tom wasn't willing to refuse the adoption, that's on him. Tom made the choice to become Jack's parent, but now that it's difficult, he's leaving Lucy to deal with it on her own. Working late and then leaving the house after work because your kid has behavioral issues and you don't want to deal with them is being a crappy parent and a crappy spouse, and it's absolutely feeding into Jack and Logan's problems. Treating Jack like he's not part of the family is not going to help Jack or Logan. So yeah, Lucy was overly optimistic about Jack's behavioral problems, but she's by no means the first parent to be that way. She went into this thinking that she would be a part of a team and now she's on her own. Tom is a jerk for agreeing to the adoption and then abandoning his post. And OP is the jerk for absolving Tom of his part in this, acting like difficult adopted kids don't also deserve homes and for what he said to Lucy. Am I the jerk for telling my sister-in-law that if her service dog can't ignore kids, he isn't a real service dog? I have two kids who are 11 and 9. My sister-in-law has a service dog who's been with her for about 6 months now. He's 18 months old. It was my son's birthday party last weekend, which she was at, and obviously had a whole ton of kids running around in my house. My daughter also had two friends over, younger siblings of the boys, as well as her pets. All in all, there were nine kids, three dogs, and a cat causing chaos. At one point, one of our rabbits escaped and was running around too. My sister-in-law's dog couldn't cope. He was so excited and wasn't paying any attention to her. My daughter and her friends said hi to him, but otherwise left him alone. He was losing his crap the whole time and my sister-in-law had to leave. 
My son was a little upset, but overall didn't mind. Just asked that she could come over for a mini birthday. Yesterday was that mini birthday. It was much quieter, just the family, and the dog was still losing it. He was jumping around and she wasn't able to control him. She had a flare-up which he ignored. She then got frustrated and asked my kids to leave the room. They did and he finally calmed down. They came back in and he got excited again. The kids weren't comfortable so they went to play and we had a conversation. I basically said, if she can't control him, I don't want him in my house. She replied that he's a service dog and goes everywhere with her, so I'd essentially be banning her. I said that he was a crappy service dog as he ignored her flare-up and wouldn't even listen. She then blamed my kids, saying my daughter had got him excited last time and now he thinks that kids mean playtime. I told her that if her service dog can't ignore kids while working, he's not really a service dog. She got upset and left, saying she was uncomfortable with me. Later on, my husband pulled me aside and asked me to apologize because I had hurt her feelings. I said I didn't think an apology would be worth it because I'm not sorry. I meant what I said. He told me he understood, but it's still a jerk move to not even try to apologize. She then texted me and said that he had a situation with a kid when he was in training, but she is paying out money to get him retrained. I don't know what the situation is, but I do feel bad. I think she was trying to use my kids to socialize him and it hasn't worked and I feel much worse. I haven't yet responded because I do still somewhat stand by what I said, but I also feel awful about making her feel so insecure. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You are absolutely right. It's not a service dog. They are extensively trained and extremely expensive. It sounds like she got a dog and someone to train it and is calling it a service dog. 18 months old sounds kind of young also. OP. Yeah, and to be honest, I'm not sure where she got him. She was talking about wanting one, and then like the following week he was in her house. That's not a legit service dog. It takes a while to apply for and be approved for a certified service dog. Then it needs to be sourced, have its temperament gauged, and have an opportunity to be matched with its new owner. Not to mention the cost for the dog and the intense training, or getting approved for a service dog provided by a nonprofit. Sounds like she just got a dog from a normal breeder. Am I the jerk for telling my sister we won't be coming to Thanksgiving since she can't get her kids' lice under control? I'm 27 female. My sister, who's 35, she has kids who are 12 and 10 and they have lice. She's been trying to get rid of lice for like a month, but they keep coming back. She's tried shampoo, special combs, everything short of cutting their hair, but for some reason the lice just keep coming back. The holidays are starting to come up and she still has yet to get it under control. I have extremely long hair that I spend a lot of time caring for and I've been growing it out for many years now. Obviously, I don't want to deal with head lice, so I told my sister over the phone that I won't make it to Thanksgiving at her house this year. When pressed why, I said it's because of the lice infestation, to which she freaked out and called me a jerk, saying she's tried everything and that the family will be disappointed if me and my boyfriend don't show up. We had a long conversation where she told me that I was being selfish. Later on, different family members called to also tell me that I was being selfish and that if I wear my hair up, I should be fine. Doubtful. This is a situation where I'm okay being the jerk, but I'm not sure if I am or not. Edit. Not to be rude, but I don't need any more lice tips or treatments. Nope. Lice is a plague. I have a feeling she's only treating the heads of the kids and nothing else in the house if the lice are still there after a month of treatment. Has she put all the kids' stuffies into hefty bags and left in a cold spot for a month? Has she removed all the down feather products from the house and waited to purchase new ones until the lice were completely gone? Are there any pets and have they been treated? Some specialty pillows even have to be bagged and stored because their fluff attracts the lice. Not the jerk, lice is insanely expensive and frustrating to treat, especially if you have long hair. I had it five times as a kid because I was on a lot of traveling sports teams and we as dumb kids shared hair products often. Every single time we had to treat it, it was insanely frustrating and painful for me. I can't believe this woman isn't more concerned about this issue. OP. I don't know what all she's done, but I doubt it's everything you're describing. And yeah, my hair is down to my knees. Getting it out would be an absolute nightmare for me. I just have that much hair. Not the jerk, but also cut the hair. A number two crew cut on the boy and a normal supermarket lice treatment will deal with that no problem. Update. So as it turns out, pretty much nobody knew how bad the infestation was or didn't know about it at all. 
A good number of relatives just thought the kids had like a small cold and figured they'd be fine. But when I dropped out, people thought that was weird because I love my sister and I always go to parties she hosts. That's when my mother explained that it's a really bad lice outbreak and that my sister was trying really hard to get it under control before Thanksgiving. That's when a bunch of other relatives started going, yeah, I think I'm going to drop out too. And before long, it was pretty much just my parents, my sister, and a very small handful of other relatives who were still going. So my sister ended up canceling and apologizing to everyone. She even called me to tell me she was under a lot of stress and she was sorry about how she spoke to me, which was nice. I did send her some of the advice you guys sent. I can't really credit any of you, so if you were one of the thousands who suggested something, I guess feel a sense of achievement. She took the kids to a lice clinic and she's having the house fumigated since it's been going on for so long. They've been staying at a hotel for a few days now while they wait. I don't really know that much about the situation beyond that, but that's what she told me. Overall, it seems like nothing spread to anybody and she might be able to get it under control. Am I the jerk for asking my wife and daughter to leave the house if they don't want to reside with my son? My wife, Rachel, who's 35, and I, 35 male, have been married for many years now and I also have a daughter, Leah, who's 14. I'm not proud to admit it, but I had another kid while I was married to Rachel through another relationship. That's Aiden, who's 12. I kept it a secret from them, and I paid child support to the mother. I was meeting absolutely all of their expenses. She herself had a good job anyway. She passed away recently, and Aiden was all alone. I did not want my son to suffer like that without any parents. The reason I did not reveal his identity to Rachel and Leah is that I did not want to cause a fight, but now I had no choice. I went through all the proper procedures to get custody of Aiden. I made him live in my house. My wife and Leah did not like it at all. They went absolutely ballistic when they learned about him and Rachel screamed about how I shouldn't even dare to think of letting him take even a step inside. Leah was saying the same stuff, but I did not back down and they eventually had to be fine with the decision. They've been absolutely livid about it and Rachel has been demanding to get Aiden away from the house. I told her that I'm not going to do that and warned her against doing anything to him. Leah got mad and asked me whether I value someone who was born of a woman like that and I lost my temper. I got up and asked them to get out of my house if they don't want to reside with Aiden. In the end, Rachel was crying and they're not talking to me now. Am I the jerk? Edit. No, I don't want Leah absent from my life. And Aiden is also my own son. I have the right to bring him to my house as his father. For those who are gleefully saying that they hope Rachel divorces me, I'd rather have Aiden in my house than to live with Rachel or Leah without him. I'm rich and I can make my own path and find another wife if I want to. Absolutely nothing justifies calling his mother the names that Leah did. Using that language absolutely blames him, his mother, and his ostracism. Also, yes, Rachel also talked about his mother this way, not just Leah. I forgot to mention that. And yes, it is my house. It's theirs as well, but not legally. I own it. Yes, I gave them time to process it. I did not bring Aiden in all of a sudden, just to clarify. You're the jerk. Give her a divorce and let her move on with this horrible part of her life. I don't think you know how badly you destroy people when you cheat on them. Some people are never able to recover from that. So just divorce her and let her go. Leave your wife and your daughter the house and go find an apartment for you because kicking her out is ridiculous. She didn't do anything, you did. You're the jerk. What's more, she had zero time to prepare and no backward information. All of this is a shock to your wife. How you can even be so angry with her is beyond me. I'm sure that your affair partner had family and people this boy could live with. You are sabotaging your marriage and your whole life for a kid who you created out of wedlock. I would first look for other family members that can take him in, and if you have to find an apartment for you and him, then divorce your wife so she can move on from this and try to recover. He also fooled her into thinking he was a half-decent person. If she had known what garbage she was married to 12 years ago, she could have divorced him then and maybe built a nice life with someone who actually loves her. He stole a decade of her life because he didn't want to start a fight, which actually means he didn't want her to know what kind of a man she was married to. You're the jerk. The situation your family is in is your fault. You cheated on your wife, you kept it a secret, and now you sprung a secret like this on them with no warning, and now they have to live with a stranger and treat him like a son and a brother with zero adjustment time. Resentment and anger is to be expected. You need to give them time to get used to the situation, 
You stepped out on your marriage, and now you're putting your secret son at a higher priority than your wife and daughter, father and husband of the year. You should have integrated your son into your family's life, not catapulted this huge curveball and said, if you don't like it, leave. And you know who your son is going to blame for the scorn he gets from his sister? You, the person who is to blame. Congrats on alienating your whole family. Not the jerk. As a rich man, you've got all kinds of options. If wife has a problem with you being there for your son, get rid of her. Let her find a broke, desperate guy. There's plenty of them out there. I regret having my son and wish I stayed child-free. Yes, I have a kid. No, I don't really post him. It's not a pick-me thing or a I'm-not-like-other-moms thing. Aside from privacy reasons, I've been struggling with the fact that I'm even a mother at all. I was pretty child-free, but due to societal and mostly spousal pressure, I had a kid against my own wishes. It messed me up so bad mentally. Then my divorce happened, and then I became a single parent. I didn't fight for anything more than 50-50 custody. I didn't want more. A lot of crap happened that I wasn't prepared for, still not. It's a burden I don't wish on anyone. It feels like you're on a leash. You can only go as far as the leash allows, but when you're at the end, it retracts and it drags you back. One week I'm free and it feels like I'm getting my life together and then the next I'm losing my mind. Toddlers are not easy. It's more exhausting than manual labor. You can call me a bad mother. In the grand scheme of things, I am. But what I don't do is show him my resentment. There are times I lose my temper and cry and hide away in another room. There are times I dread when my free week ends or look forward to the week of parenting to end. It sounds awful, I know. It's a slap in the face when people ask me about having more kids or that things don't last forever. Kids grow, yes, but it doesn't negate the struggles you're currently going through. When a kid that doesn't regulate their emotions well pushes the button of someone who also can't regulate their emotions, it's horrible. My life is also beyond kids. It's an entire universe. Friends, family, relationships, career, etc. is a part of it. So is my son. He's not my universe, but a part of it. So for society to reduce me to nothing more than a single mom is insulting. I don't know why I'm posting this honestly. It's not necessarily a cry for help. Maybe a place to vent and get my feelings out. I love my son like a mother would instinctively, but sometimes I look at him and feel nothing. When he cries, I get mad more than I want to nurture him. I wanted to give my ex-husband more custody and find myself, but my family threatens to disown me. I'm afraid that my presence in his life does more harm than good. Being a parent is not easy or as enjoyable as people make it out to be. I love my kids, but I hate being a parent. Why not give up all the rights to the kid then? The dad wanted him, you didn't. He should be with the one who wants him in my opinion. If he pressured you, he should have taken the kid after the divorce. Tell your family if they care so much, they should be watching over the kid themselves. I'm going to get downvoted to heck for this, but the kid didn't choose to be born. He's going to sense your resentment whether you think he will or not. If you leave him with dad, he will have emotional difficulties because of it. If you don't, he's going to have emotional difficulties because of your resentment. Pressured or not, you had this kid and his well-being is your responsibility. Grow up. Get therapy. His dad is in the picture. You get breaks to work on yourself, so do it. Girlfriend got annoyed when I pointed out her hypocritical views on cheating. My girlfriend and I have been together for just under three years. One thing she really hates and has regularly got angry about is people who cheat in relationships, which I agree with. There's never an excuse for cheating and we both seem to have the same values about that. One of my friends cheated on his partner last year. I didn't try to make excuses for him. I agreed with my girlfriend when she got annoyed and ranted about how wrong he was. And I did mention to him that he was out of order for doing it and most of the friendship group agreed. My girlfriend went on a night out with some friends last weekend and the next morning she was talking about it and she mentioned one of her friends who was in a relationship was dancing with other guys, going up to random guys and having her arm around them and she tried to kiss a couple of them. One rejected her and another she only didn't kiss because another of the friends stopped her. My girlfriend was laughing when she was talking about it and I just pointed out that her friend is actively trying to cheat on her boyfriend then. My girlfriend disagreed and said it wasn't like that and she wasn't cheating but I just pointed out that she's trying to kiss other men on nights out so yeah she's cheating. My girlfriend got annoyed and said I was wrong for talking like that about her friend but I just said my girlfriend is being a bit of a hypocrite considering her previous attitudes towards cheating and her reaction when it was one of her friends. 
She said I was being unfair to her for nothing, but I just pointed out she's making excuses for bad behavior when it comes to her friends. She just repeated that I was being out of line and too harsh towards her for no reason. How would you handle this? Also, her friend is not in an open relationship. First thing I would do is ask her if she was kissing other guys on her girl's night out, or if she would consider doing so in the future. She seems to think it's okay, so it's a legit question, and it would explain her defensiveness. I'm not saying it's breakup worthy, but if that's her attitude, it's worth a discussion on boundaries. Either your girlfriend actually only gets angry about guys who cheat, or she has a definition of cheating in which her line is drawn differently from yours. Feels like either of those is problematic for the future of this relationship. The fact that her girl's night out involves her friends flirting with, dancing with, and trying to kiss other men, and she literally considers this so normal that it's a conversational topic with you, kind of feels like it raises some obvious questions about her actions during the night. She's doing the same thing and thinks it's okay. This is why you don't date girls who do the whole night out thing. Let others call you insecure all they want to. I'd rather have a girlfriend who wants to kick back on the sofa and watch a movie with me than someone who wants to go out to clubs, drink, and meet other guys. Stop settling for these kinds of partners. The reason your girlfriend adamantly doesn't consider this behavior cheating is because she has done the exact same thing. The cognitive dissonance will never allow her to see this as cheating since she cannot see herself or admit to herself that she is a cheater despite being one herself. If she concedes that her friend is a cheater, then that would involve admitting to herself that she's a cheater as well, which she is internally denying. Girls just want to have fun. It was no big deal. Tell the boyfriend what happened and your girlfriend's friend may very well tell the truth of what your own girlfriend has done. Just be ready to face it. Do nothing all night for a ton of overtime? Sure, why not? Backstory. I worked at the time in an oil change place. They had recently moved managers from salaried to hourly because some managers in different cities were just lying and not going to work while getting the same check every payday. And I warned them that if anything, my pay was going to go way up because I'm here a lot more than 40 hours a week. They were good with that, they said. Well, one night I get a call at 7 p.m., two hours after close, from one of my guys who was in the shop after hours without permission and crashed into a bay door, like a garage door. All auto shops have at least a few. He got fired. That's not malicious compliance at all, just the setup. So I came in and investigated. The most relevant fact here was that he bent the door so there was a maybe 4 inch by 4 inch gap. A house cat could have squeezed through easily. I called our door repair guys immediately. They said their folks were on an emergency after hours call already, to somewhere 5 hours away. They could be there in the morning. I said okay, since this wasn't a danger. The door was in place, not visible from the street. You'd have to be behind our building looking for this kind of thing to find it. Alarm still sets, motion detectors work. Anyone that broke in through this metal door with a 4 inch gap would have needed tools and was going to get in even without the gap. We don't even keep more than 100 bucks cash around and anything expensive to steal was equipment bolted to the floor. Deal with it tomorrow, right? Obviously no. Called my boss to fill him in and he said to call the door guys. I told him I did already and tried to explain their situation. He interrupted me and told me in super rude and loud words just to call them and not bother him again about it, then texted me to rudely say that I better darn well stay there until they arrive and finish the repair. So since I was single, had no plans, and was now paid hourly, I clocked in. I decided this sounded like easy money, pulled up two comfy office chairs to make a bed slash couch, watched YouTube, and did assorted internet scrolling, slept at normal times pretty comfortably all the way to 8 a.m., they showed up around 9 and fixed the problem pretty quickly. I was already on my regularly scheduled 8 to 5 shift that day, which I finished. So now let's do the math. That overnight waiting, 7 p.m. to 8 a.m., 13 hours. All at time and a half. So 22 hours at a time and a half equals 33 hours of pay for doing my normal shift plus internet scrolling and napping that was barely even an inconvenience. My boss sees it come payday and tries to give me a yelling over email for trying to rip off the company, CCing all the big bosses, HR, payroll, etc. I reply to all, explain the situation, and include the text screenshot. Suddenly, I'm not the one getting yelled at anymore, and I got every bit of that overtime pay. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard.
or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.